What's up guys? It's yo boy Omnisensei. Welcome to, What if AFA Martial Arts Master Transmigrated into Tai Lung? Part 4. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story, link in the description. With all that out of the way, enjoy! Tai Lung's POV I wrapped my hands with the bandage, and made sure my claws remained out, without having to flex my fingers constantly. Although it did not hinder me in a fight, it was a different case when it was war. It would be a battle of attrition for me, especially since I was going up against 50,000 soldiers alone. So I could not waste any stamina or focus on my claws, and by doing this, they would not retract automatically like it usually does. I continued marching fearlessly towards the enemy army while I finished wrapping my hands. Then I coat my claws with my kai, as they started letting out black smoke, and they became pitch black. Can this be considered armament haki? I pondered in my mind as my feet continued pacing towards the enemy. After I was a little closer, I looked up and quickly scanned my enemy. They had spike walls which were roughly made in a hurry, and towers which were built with logs and ropes. They probably made that as quickly as they could, and even though the quality was barely acceptable, the sheer amount they were able to build in a matter of days was impressive. I looked to the side and tried to see the end of the ever-expanding spiky walls, but I couldn't. They probably spanned over miles at least. But the most interesting part about the enemy was the sheer number they had. No one would argue if you said it was impossible for one person to defeat 50,000 soldiers. Even if they remained still and without fighting and I killed one soldier every second. It would take me a whole day to kill them all. That was how outnumbered I was. Yet, I did not feel a drop of nervousness in my heart against such vast enemies. If Master Rhino could slay 10,000 serpents when he was young, I assure you I can slay 50,000 elite soldiers of Shu. Obviously, the serpents Master Rhino slayed were an untrained group of bandits in the Valley of Woe, while mine were elite soldiers of Kingdom Shu. But to make up for it, I was also much stronger than him. So in theory, I should be able to come out victorious from this battle. Probably. In the end, I like the challenge. And it will be a great way to get a reputation other than just being labeled as a villain, due to Ugwe's words. Not only that, it will be a huge moral boost to my soldiers for the other wars to come. The soldiers who stood opposite to me were mostly made up of primates ranging from chimpanzee, mandrills, gorillas, baboon etc. But there were also few other types of animals with them. The Kingdom of Shu, also known as Shu Han, is a kingdom located in the west, and their territory is characterized by rugged terrain, including mountains, rivers, and dense forests. This geographical position provided natural defenses against invading forces, and helped shape Shu's military strategies. So, although the soldiers in front of me were made to stop any forces from invading, they were far from being their last line of defense. This was another reason why I came alone here, attacking from the north. The north especially had rough terrains which were not very suitable for an army to travel, much less an army with iron cannons. So it would be easier and more convenient if a strong individual force could spear through the northern defense alone. I continued walking towards the army, and when I finally came into the range of arrows, they did not waste any time and started shooting at me. I still did not make any big moves as I easily evaded the arrows while walking. I also swiped my claws to cut any arrows making their way towards me, and they quickly realized their method of attack was a waste of effort. I took off my cloak and dropped it on the ground. I threw on a huge smile on my face as I started picking up pace. What? Why is he here? I could hear the commotion that was followed by my reveal. Why the hell is Tai Lung here? Is he really planning on taking all of us alone? Is he insane? I thought he was supposed to be the Supreme General. Why isn't he with his army? I smiled at their confusion as it was exactly what we planned and expected. Although it was true that it was strange to see a general fighting alone without his army. This was the best way we could win this war, with the least amount of casualty. Although I have said I knew many war strategies and trained in the art of war since I was young, none of what I learned applied to the army under me. I know how to sabotage the enemies, how to plan a meticulous ambush, how to use the terrain to my advantage, and so on, but none of my teachings about war apply to warfare that utilizes cannons. It was a drastic change in tactics and nature, a completely different kind of war, one which was unlike the direct confrontation between armies. So whether I was leading it or Shen was leading it, our strategy would be pretty much the same. In fact, 
I think it was more suitable that the creator of the weapons strategize on how to best use his weapons. I put the last train of thought away, and I got on all fours before I started sprinting towards the army. My sudden change in pace caught the army off guard, but the distance between us was still plentiful, so they had ample time to react. Or so they thought. Do not underestimate him just because he is by himself. Remember you are all facing Tai Lung, and if history has anything to teach us, then it is to never underestimate him. Do not hold back. Shield Wall, the general of the army, a rough-looking mandrel yelled out to his soldiers. I continued sprinting towards them with the speed of a cheetah. I kicked up dust and ash with every stretch of my limbs, and that told me that they had probably burned the place to clear up the vegetation and their preparation for war. The morning sun was up in the sky and lit up a battleground. We were a few kilometers apart, but under the bright sky, they could clearly see me approaching as I quickly closed the distance between us. They braced for the upcoming battle and kept their eyes on my figure until suddenly, I vanished from their view. Flash steps. I moved at a speed so fast that I became a blur which they could not see from such a distance. My movements were swift and shockingly. I did not kick up the ash under my feet. There was no indication of my earlier existence as the place fell into absolute silence. Seconds ticked away as the soldiers turned their heads in search of me. They questioned if I was a mere illusion or a ghost as they lost sight of me. What's going on? Where is he? They asked each other. The general on the other hand was silent, and his expression was grave. Years of instincts honed in battles won and lost screamed at him. Everyone brace yourself, the mandrel general screamed out of pure instinct. And not long after, an explosion erupted from the front lines. Bodies flew out like pieces of darbies, as I crashed into the shield wall they had erected. The wooden spikes and pieces of armor exploded out, injuring multiple soldiers. I had covered the few kilometers distance between us in seconds. I had a huge grin on my face and my eyes glowed bright yellow before I moved further into their ranks. Then I started wreaking havoc on the battlefield. They had no time to react, and some were still not sure what was happening. But I did not wait for them to catch up, bodies started falling. I put myself in the middle of the army and started launching an all-out attack. I was careful to spare as much soldier as possible though. After we capture the kingdom, these same soldiers were going to be our army which we would march to the conquer the rest of the kingdoms. They were precious resources so I used nerve attacks as much as I could, or I would cut their tendons to put them down. I was outnumbered by a huge margin, so I had to make sure each swing of my limb took down multiple soldiers, and every movement I made did not go to waste. I could not sacrifice one movement to take down one person, so I had to get creative with the way I fought. And my mastery of all the kung fu and my unmatched knowledge in combat allowed me to do just that. I stitched together movements to create something more than just one effect. Each sweep of my leg and every swipe of my claws were done with multiple purposes. To block an incoming attack, to take down one person, to set up for the next attack, to cause distraction to the others, etc. Get him, don't let him escape, they screamed as they finally got out of their initial shock. They swarmed at me like millions of ants. My enemies came like ocean waves as their suffocating number threatened to swallow me. Then I leapt to the sky and escaped the swarm. I kicked the air and propelled myself higher and higher into the sky. The soldier could only look up and marvel at the show of impossible feet before I changed position and shot towards the ground like a falling star. I infused Kai in my attack and crashed on the ground. Boom. The attack sent out shockwaves and turned the earth into waves as they spread out, and the vibration caused many to fall down, while some even broke their legs. There was a shocked silence in the air as the reality of the situation settled in on everyone. They looked at their fallen comrades and replayed my feats of strength in their minds. A consecutive realization morphed each of their expression and it finally clicked in their mind. This was a war. A war. That means at this moment 50,000 of them and one of me were equal and would be fighting for victory. It will not be an easy fight. The thought of capturing me or killing me with ease died in their mind. It's me against them. The weight of my name bore down on their heart, and it was heavy. It was no longer a tale they heard in the tavern, no longer a rumor someone told someone. It was more than a story. I was more than a villain the hero put down. Tai Lun. They felt the name had a new meaning to it. The scene in front of them and the name with all its reputation cinch in their mind. They yelled out with all of their might, trying to disperse the fear and panic that slowly knocked at the back door of their heart. It was fight or die. So they charged at me with everyone they had. The battle finally starts. The war begun. Ha 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 ha. I laugh. Come at me. Tai Lung's POV for the first few hours. I was focused on the battle. I meticulously utilized my knowledge my techniques and strength to put down my enemies without killing them. Of course, some deaths were unavoidable, but I tried my best to not waste lives. 
I danced around the battlefield, my movements were of calculated perfection, and each stroke of my limbs pantied a beautiful scene of violence. I used different kung fu techniques to surprise and take down my enemies, and they did not stand a chance. Half a day passed and my senses were all lost. My ears had numb due to the battle cry, which would shortly turn into screams of agony. My nose could only smell the scent of iron and blood, both were cold. My eyes only saw the attack thrown with every intention to kill me. Everywhere I looked, I saw threats which I immediately addressed and neutralized before they could harm me. Being surrounded by constant danger will take a mental toll on anyone. Even when I looked up to meet the eyes of my fellow warriors, I could not see them. I only saw the opening in their defense, the gap in their armor which I could cut. They were completely dehumanized in my eyes. They were merely like dummies from a training ground which I must attack at the right moment without hesitation. Hesitation could be death. My grey fur was bathed in red, and it sticks to my skin. The blood was dried and stuck to my body, making me incapable of feeling the warmth of the sun. I continued fighting. With all of my senses dulled to such an extent, it felt like a dream. I don't feel the anchor of reality as I slowly lose myself. But the difference was that my bodies moved exactly as I wanted and ordered. There was no sluggish movement or weakness, I was powerful, and I took down anyone who entered my sight. I used flash steps to move from one place to another on the battlefield. I would move away quickly before I could be swarmed, and that same action was repeated for hundreds of times. I conserved my Kai as much as I could, but I mostly couldn't help myself from strengthening my body with it, or using it to coat my nails. My breath was rhythmic as I used the sun breathing constant. I also utilized water streaming rock smashing fist as it took advantage of the opponent's strength and it saved me a lot of stamina. I was the master of force. Nearly a day passed and the fight continued even at night. At this point, I was not even thinking anymore as my body had adapted to the constant battle. I did not even have to focus or think to be in motion. My body went into autopilot, and I moved with practiced ease and instinct. Even without my knowledge, I took many lives and crippled more. Fighting the battle became as natural as breathing at that point, and I was able to zone out even though I continued moving and fighting. I was growing stronger. As I had thought, battles were the best way to increase my fighting prowess. As I could my techniques becoming more refined with each second the fight went on. I also got more proficient at using my kai to the point that like I said, I could zone out and have an internal monologue while I fight. Just die you monster, a silverback gorilla yelled and brought his giant warhammer down at me. I blurred from my position and appeared behind him as the hammer missed me by such a huge margin that it was laughable. He had a decent amount of strength though as the ground quaked under his strength. The ground exploded and instead of hurting me, he caused problems for his comrades. That's not very nice. I put my head over his shoulder and whispered in his ear from behind. His whole body twitched and he turned around and swung his hammer at me again. But he only hit the air. With how well he was armored and his strength, he must be one of the commanders. I thought to myself before an evil grin stretched my lips. I caught the silverback by the arm, and after I pivoted on my heel, I threw him towards the other incoming soldiers. I also stole his giant warhammer as I sent him flying towards his subordinates. His body slammed against a dozen of the other soldiers, and I threw his warhammer in the air. He let out a groan, and when he finally realized what happened, he hurriedly pushed himself up. But before he could do anything else, his own hammer fell on his head, and he was knocked out cold. His body fell on the soldiers below again, burying them under his gigantic frame. Hair. Although he was not as heavy as Master Rhino, I reckon the soldiers would not have a fun time under him. Speaking of Master Rhino, the reason why he was so heavy was due to Kai. Like Mantis whose body held strength beyond his size and Poe with his rubber body, Master Rhino was also way heavier than you would ever expect of his size. It was not an exaggeration when I said his swings felt like they had the weight of a mountain behind them. His heavy weight, coupled with his hammer and spinning fighting style, was a deadly combination I remembered to this day. Although I beat him seemingly easily, that was because I knew how to exploit the weakness of his techniques. In a pure contest of raw strength and power, he could rival me. That made me curious if I could have such a special body constitution. I knew it was due to Kai, but how did they achieve it? Was it due to their superior bloodline or something else? I definitely wanted a passive buff like that. I crouched down and I waited a few seconds for the soldiers to swarm on me again. It was daybreak so it was extremely dark, 
but I had a natural night vision as a cat, so I barely even noticed the dark. When the soldiers were going to gang up on me again, I blurred. My movement was violent like the wind as sparks erupted from different places in the dark. My claws easily ripped their armor, and I cut them right at the places I wanted. When I appeared behind them again, they all fell on the ground like puppets whose strings had been cut. The battle continues. Three days after the battle had started, ha ha! The sound of my needy breath and gasps filled the broken battlefield as I stood on top of a giant pile of bodies. Some were dead, while the others were unconscious. Where 50,000 strong elite soldiers once filled the area with their domineering presence, now a broken silence hung in the air. The silence was not due to the natural lack of sound either. It was silenced. The battleground was soaked in blood, and the bodies that were scattered around were more than random pebbles. The scent of decomposing corpses also filled the place, painting a scene on GHT out of hell. Victory is mine. I declared after catching my breath. My body was smeared in dirt and blood, and beneath lies small wounds and scratches which I got from the battle. They were not lethal injuries, but it shows that the fight I went through was not an easy one. But I have done it all the same. I accomplished a feat like no one had before. I slew 50,000 soldiers alone and won the battle that would take a royal army to win. The pride that was bubbling in my heart was something I thought I would never experience again. A smile tugged my lips as I basked at the reality. The reality where I was invincible. I felt at home at this moment in this broken battlefield. With my body groaning in exhaustion and my Kai reaching near depletion, I was relaxed and free like never before. Maybe. Maybe this was what I was born for. Maybe this was what I was meant to do. Because this felt way better than playing the role of a hero and protecting everyone. I was meant for war. And I realized on the third day that that was not a bad thing. Some people were just born to fight and conquer. It doesn't have to make me a demon or the personification of evil either. That is just how I am. My nature. This is me. I like chasing a tall ambition and fighting with everything I had to obtain what I desired, rather than protecting what was already there and keeping everything safe. Igwe created Kung Fu as a form of self-defense, and to protect those we hold dear. But that was not what Kung Fu was to me. Instead, it was a way to being absolute. It was a form of power that allowed me to accomplish impossible feats like this, and take what I wanted even with the world opposing me. It was a weapon that allowed me to go against the universe itself. It was something that will never betray me even if destiny turned her back on me. To me, that was Kung Fu. My Kung Fu. I guess Ugwe was right, there is indeed darkness in me. But if that was what I truly am, then I would embrace it instead of running away from it. After all, darkness was just as necessary as the light. It's what the symbol of Kung Fu stands for right? Yin and Yang. The silence of the aftermath taught me who I was as I basked in my new identity, my true identity. I held up my blood-soaked hands and carefully observed it as I was about to achieve something I was struggling with for a long time. I pushed my Kai out of my body. But this time instead of just calling out the uppermost layer of my white Kai, I also summoned my blue Kai outside. I let them out in equal portions, and then I was easily able to control them. I let them flow from one body part to the other as I shaped my Kai, just as I wanted even when they were outside of my body. It was something I was not able to do before. To think it was this simple, I said to myself. All this time I was just letting my white Kai outside, not knowing I was letting out an incomplete part of my Kai. That was why I had such a difficult time controlling my Kai when it left my body. I was able to do everything when it was inside because they were complete. My white Kai alone or my blue Kai alone cannot work without the other, they needed to be together. They were two expressions in one Kai, so when I only tried to control my white Kai, I was unable to do so. I just needed them to be equal and coexist to control it however I wanted. I got this enlightenment when I finally found my true identity. Do not suppress it. Let them both be free. Embrace it. I am Tai Lung. I whispered, but everything heard me. I put down my hand and turned my focus in the distance where three warriors who were above the rest walked out. They have been mere spectators through the battle as they ordered the soldiers to attack me and control their formation as much as they could. They were hoping for me to tire out, and even if I was able to beat all of the 50,000 soldiers, they hoped they would be able to take me down right after it. Tai Lung, the general of the Shu army stepped forward and started speaking. His voice was filled with fear and unadulterated admiration when he addressed my name. My name is Jin Dao, the mandrel said and bowed like a young student bowing to their master. I have served the kingdom of Shu for the most part of my life, and as its loyal servant, I want to ask no. Beg you to reconsider your alliance with Lord Shen, and your plan on taking over Shu Han. He asked me while bowing his head. Although he did it with such humility and determination, I could not grant his request. 
I'm afraid that would not be possible. I said, my ambition far exceeds what anyone had in mind, and my goal is too big to abandon for the sake of one kingdom. Conquering Shu is merely a tiny portion of something grander. Jin Dao stayed silent for some time before he nodded, and he looked up. I understand. Jin Dao said, but I can only plead that you will not be cruel to my beloved kingdom and its citizens, and to spare my two great commanders. I am sure it can be beneficial to your goals too, as they are great warriors. I looked at the two commanders behind him, and they had grim expressions. Their plan was to fight me and hopefully take me down in my exhausted state, but they knew they had no chance, so they resorted to getting my pity. He must also be hopeful in his request, seeing that I spared many of his soldiers who lay unconscious right now. With my earlier hint of a greater goal in the speech of Lord Chen, he must have put two and two together. You can be assured that no innocent lives would be harmed in my conquest. I was strong enough to promise that, and I would prefer not wasting the lives of Kung Fu masters as well. But I noticed something peculiar. You never begged for your own life. I said. He sighed in relief and finally showed a smile. Words came from the east that Lord Shen is successful in his invasion. With you by his side, the kingdom of Shu is destined to fall. My loyalty lies with Shu Han forever, and I plan to fall with it if I cannot protect it. It will also be a great honor to die with my brave soldiers and by your hands. I chuckled, such a plethora of requests coming from the defeated. Please. Jin Dao said, I have fought in many great wars and won many battles. At least allow me this honor of meeting my end to a superior general. He sure knew how to butter up someone. He must have learned it from staying by his king's side. Well, I am in a good mood today. I said and leapt off the pile of bodies and landed in front of him. Consider your request granted. I said. A single second did not pass before his eyes suddenly glow bright blue and his claws extended. His mouth opened wide and displayed his sharp fangs that were longer than my fingers. He launched himself towards me with all his strength, and I just smoked at him. My kaya exploded out as it coated my body just like Monkey King did. I was finally able to replicate his enhancement fully after learning how to control my kai, even when it was outside my body. My grey fur started glowing softly as I shot out like a missile. I was so fast that my movement made a sound only when I stopped behind Jin Dao. I stood there and flicked my hand to calm the fresh blood off them. Jin Dao had the entire vertical half of his body torn off as he fell down with a reverberating thud. It was the end of Mighty General, but also the beginning of a greater one. His two commanders immediately went to care for his corpse as I started walking away from the battlefield. Triumphed. Third POV The Great Battle of the Chengdu Plain. It was a battle where one master fought against 50,000 soldiers and came out victorious. The news spread throughout China like a wildfire. The shocking information shook the very foundation of China itself as one name resounded in the hearts of everyone. The Supreme General Tai Lun. His past feats of killing Wu Bao, defeating Master Rhino and even fighting against six members of the Kung Fu Council were forgotten as a greater feat struck the hearts of every animal. It was hard for a simple civilian to be impressed when one master defeated another master, as they did not know the true gap in strength between the ordinary and a kung fu master. So although impressive, such news were common and never shocked anyone too much. But going up against 50,000 soldiers and coming out as the victor, that was something that left the people in absolute awe and worship. They may not be able to comprehend how impressive the feat of defeating six masters by one is. But they could imagine with their limited mind how impossible it was to defeat 50,000 soldiers alone. That is why Kung Fu masters were mostly known for their accomplishments in wars colon. Master Thundering Rhino, the Slayer of 10,000 Serpents, the Furious Five, Slayer of 5,000 Soldiers in the Battle of Weeping River. Although Master Rhino's feat seemed close to Tai Lung's accomplishment on paper, the people know the difference between bandit serpents and an elite soldier of a kingdom. The soldiers had strength they could comprehend, so it was now that they truly realized what kind of warrior Tai Lung was. The strongest. There was no doubt in everyone's mind because no one had even come close to what Tai Lung had just done. Even Master Ogwe whose very ground they worshipped as a sacred place had no such feat. The name of the dragon warrior which had been a constant traveling tale, was also discarded as the people had a more impressive tale to tell. The news only intensified when the surviving soldiers started retelling the battle that took place in vivid detail. Their stories, greatly affected by their nightmares and PTSD, were truly something else. The unification of all the kingdoms in China was first thought to be a joke, and was mostly thought to be the ambition of Lord Shen. But as the story spread, the people came to learn that it was also Tai Lung's ambition, just as it was Lord Shen's. And with Tai Lung's great feat of power, the people stopped thinking that it was a mere joke. It could really happen. It was a joke when Lord Shen declared it. 
But after learning that Tai Lung shared the same ambition, many thought it was possible. A great change was approaching. It was the end of an epoch, and the start of a new era. Tai Lung became more than a failed dragon warrior. He became more than a villain in people's minds. After all, whether they were good or evil, people couldn't help but admire the strong in a world like Kung Fu Panda. The stories about Tai Lung being evil and going on a rampage also became irrelevant when people realized his true might. He went on a rampage and did not destroy the entirety of Mylan City. He went on a rampage, and the village and the Valley of Peace still existed. Stop telling lies if he truly went on a rampage. Such places would be wiped off the map. A warrior capable of rivaling 50,000 soldiers had more than enough strength to bury a city or a village. So what else could these rumors be but lies? Master Wu Ba fought bravely, and managed to stop Tai Lung from destroying the city. The dragon warrior earned Tai Lung's respect after the fight. Nice joke bro. All of the previous rumors died as Tai Lung's true show of strength killed them all. People did not even want to act like they believed those in the first place. After the Battle of Chengdu Plain, there was a drastic change in the people's opinion about Tai Lung. As he had said, Kung Fu was a form of power that made things absolute. It was a weapon Tai Lung used to battle against the universe itself. He had changed his fate. Because no one remembers a villain, the people only remember Tai Lung. There was also also a new nickname the people called Tai Lung. After learning of his true might and realizing that his strength could even rival a kingdom by itself, they called him Colon, the 11th power of China, the walking kingdom, the supreme general Tai Lung. Third POV after Tai Lung was done with his battle. He went south and started journeying down to the kingdom of Shu. He took almost a week to finally reunite with the rest of his army. Since he took the time to heal from the battle, and to also clear up any defense line the kingdom built up in the north. It was nothing compared to the 50,000 soldiers as the army stationed there were only a few thousand. Tai Lun with his new mastery over Kai, was easily able to spear through them all. By the time he met up with his army again, they had already taken over half of the territory of Shu. The battles on Lord Shen's side were also successful, as Tai Lung had already spearheaded most of Shu Han's army. Shen was absolutely ecstatic when he learned of Tai Lung's victory. He was not frightened by Tai Lung's strength or got angry to be so outshined. Instead, the peacock was over the moon. This might be confusing to some, but they were already allies, so he did not even consider Tai Lung to be an enemy or possible enemy. For all his villainy, Shen was raised like a royal. The oath which was made in his name, belief and blood on the sacred ground, was permanent. He knew that Tai Lung was a great warrior who would forever respect the oath too. Just like him. Also, he had come to consider Tai Lung as something as close to a friend he had. With their shared childhood and similar stories and ambition, it was hard to not call Tai Lung his brother in arms. Like Wu Wei and Kai, they had a lot of time to interact when they made plans and discussed new ways to use gunpowder for war. This was another reason why Shen liked Tai Lung. He could understand Shen. They both seemed to be made for war and conflict. They saw the explosion of power in the fireworks while the rest of the world got lost in its colors. After the Supreme General and his army finally reunited, they took another week to heal and rejuvenate themselves, before they would launch the final attack towards the Kingdom of Shu. The war started again after a week, and it was an absolute demolition on the Shu Han side. The army Shu had remaining was a mere 30,000 soldiers. Tai Lung alone could destroy them completely. The kingdom also lost its General Jin Dao, and the morale amongst the soldiers could not get any worse with the reputation of Tai Lung. They realized they had no chance of winning, and were only fighting to protect their honor. The other soldiers who survived the Battle of Chengdu Plain, did not want to participate in the war anymore, as they feared Tai Lung. So the kingdom stood no chance. After four days of marching towards the capital of Shu while also destroying any forces they sent to stop them, the kingdom finally surrendered. This only increased Tai Lung's reputation, and proved his worth as a general. He not only possessed individual strength, but could lead an army with ease and expertise. They did not kill anyone anymore after Shu surrendered as is stated in the codes of war, and Lord Shen finally displayed his intellect in politics, and was able to get the nobles of even the royal family to continue working under him. Their main ambition was to unite China and expand to the rest of the world. So Lord Shen needed help in ruling all of the territory, so he made the kingdom of Shu a vassal state. He also displayed his charisma again by delivering a speech to the people of Shu, where he assured the citizens that their daily life was not going to be affected negatively in any way, and that the current ruler was still going to govern them. He told them not to consider it as a loss, but as a victory, because Xu was witnessing the start of a new era. It will be the first kingdom in the quest to unify China, 
so they should celebrate instead of being sad. Tai Lung's reputation really became vital in this part, as the people believed the unification of China was possible. Instead of the loss, Lord Shen gave them a victory and won them over to his side. If they wanted to conquer the world, he knew they needed to maintain a good relation with every kingdom that comes under them. They couldn't have a civil war or conflict when they fought against the world after all. Lord Shen and Tai Lung worked perfectly together as a team, covering each other's weaknesses. This impressive display of turning a hostile enemy into a friendly term was just a small show of Shen's ability. Although Tai Lung was a warrior, he could respect the scholar's intelligence. In total, the two of them took one month to take the whole kingdom under them. It was a display of frightening efficiency, as they just accomplished something the rest of the kingdom had been trying to do for centuries. And with the conquest of Shu Han, Tai Lung and Lord Shen completed the first step towards their ultimate ambition. Third POV the kingdom of Nanzao. We need to act quickly Tai Lung and Shen. Are going to come for us next. It's only a matter of time. Don't you see the advisor of the king of Nanazhao screamed in frustration. There were many people in the courtroom as they discussed about the apparent defeat of Shu, and how to deal with this new, aggressive threat, that had popped up beside them. I think we should wait and see how they react first. Surely they will not go for the next kingdom until they settle down properly. One of them commented much to the annoyance of the advisor. Have you all lost your fucking mind? The kingdom of Shu waited and look what has become of them. The advisor spat it out in anger. Just say that you are afraid of Tai Lung. He yelled, cowards. Cowards all of you. The advisor, a bird species called Cassowary, was a giant bird who was extremely hot-headed even though he was at the later half of his life. Calm yourself, advisor. The king said in a gentle voice. He was a beautiful golden pheasant with a calm and gentle demeanor. The advisor bit his own tongue and resisted the urge to lash out even further. He wanted to kick the heads off of all these coward nobles, who knew only how to give honey words to their king, when times were good, but would run away instantly when their life was threatened. You indeed, you are correct. We need to make our moves as quickly as possible. We can't wait for them to gather their forces again, and attack us when they feel comfortable. In this situation, attacking is our greatest defense. He said, displaying his wisdom as king much to the advisor's relief. This was why he had served him all this time. But is that wise, my lord? One of the nobles spoke up again. Shouldn't we be aiming to ally with them or something? Can we even defeat them in a war? If Lord Shen and Tai Lung with barely a thousand strong army and the resources of a city could take over Shu in a month, imagine what they would be able to do with all the remaining army of Shu and their new resources. Could they win? They didn't think so. The advisor was fuming, considering whether he should go against his king's wishes to teach those nobles how hard he could kick. But the king raised his wings, and he calmed himself down. Allying with them is not an option. They have made their intention clear when they declared war against the whole of China. The king said, and I do not appreciate your attitude in my courtroom. You may leave. The king said in a tone of finality, guards. The noble had a sour expression as he was guided out of the courtroom, and the advisor huffed at the display, he was pleased. Sorry about that. Now, returning to the discussion the king draws and addressed his subjects, although the odds might not look favorable to us, we have a good chance of winning this war, if we play our cards right. Lord Shen is not the only one with an army killing master as an ally. The king said and a gentle smile appeared on his face. You don't mean one of the nobles guessed and gulped. Send a messenger to Mighty Eagle. The king said and the advisor let out a hearty laughter. E, but Master Eagle is in seclusion training to attain inner peace. And he had specifically asked not to be disturbed. Should we really force him like that? He also really gets sensitive when he feels his freedom is limited. The kingdom he swore to protect is under threat. He will respect the wish of its king. The golden pheasant said and everyone nodded, arguing no further. But that's not all. I also have another plan the king said. And his gentle smile slowly turned not so gentle. The next day, a messenger of the royal court was sent to the Tower of Heaven, which was a giant rocky mountain in the southernmost part of the kingdom. The messenger flew up the giant mountain which was so tall that it seemed to pierce through the heavens. Not many birds could achieve such a feat in this world, and the fact that Master Eagle made it his home shows just how powerful he truly was. After a long time of struggling and flying, the messenger finally reached the place, and he immediately hid inside the cave which Master Eagle used as his home. I have been waiting for you. A deep voice which was oddly high-pitched at the same time rang out. His voice sounded so wrong to the ear that it caused anyone to hear it uncomfortable. If he screeched loudly, a person's ear would surely rupture, Master Eagle. The messenger called out in awe and respect. He immediately bowed down to the mighty eagle who was turning his back on him. I heard her cry so many times over the year, so I was sure that my presence would be needed eventually. The eagle said and slowly turned around and walked forward to the light. 
His body was gigantic and heavy for a bird like him which should be impossible. But such things as defying simple biology was easy with the help of Kai. So, who is he? Mighty Eagle asked, his piercing voice tinged with anger. Aye, it's Tai Lung, the messenger said, confused at how he was able to know so much even before he delivered the message. He also wondered who Master Eagle was referring to when he said her. Ah, Master Eagle said as his eyes glazed over with recognition and excitement. The old cat is out of prison, huh? Master Eagle said. Interesting. Third POV, PFTTTT. I knew you would follow behind me soon enough. Jin Dao heard a voice immediately after he was brutally killed by Tai Lung. One moment he had the entire half of his body ripped off, and then he felt his soul being pulled out and he found himself in this place. He slowly opened his eyes, and he was greeted with an amazing sight. The world was not how he remembered it. He felt extremely light as if all the burdens on his soul were lifted. That was not just in a physical sense either as he felt all of his worries, regrets and anger dissolving into nothing. He was in absolute peace. Oi, I'm talking to you old monkey. Maybe not absolute peace. Where are we? Jin Dao asked the monkey king who was floating in front of him in a lazy sleeping position. Well, if you have not already deduced by now then let me say. The Monkey King draws shifts in the air and opens his arms. Welcome to the spirit realm, the afterlife of all the people with a mutated Kai, otherwise known as Kung Fu Masters. The Monkey revealed grandly, why do you look so surprised? Did someone kill you while you sleep? Monkey King asked Jin Dao, whose eyes were wide in shock. What? No. Jin Dao huffed. I died at the hands of Tai Lung because I fought to the very end. He boasted with puffed chest. What I am surprised about was seeing you here. The letter said you disappeared. It never mentioned about you dying. Yeah, about that? The Monkey King scratched his cheek. I found out that I couldn't survive the explosion of 10 barrels of gunpowder. So you were killed by Shen and you died because of a powder. Jin Dao deadpanned. The Monkey King looked offended and was about to retort and give the old monkey a piece of his mind. But his words got stuck on his throat when a green blade with chains connected to it wrapped around Jin Dao. What? Wush Monkey King quickly dodged the incoming blades and moved away. His body was encased in yellow kai. As he immediately turned around to look at the new guy that ambushed him, an explosion of green light enveloped the entire realm, blinding the Monkey King before the looked at the bull, who was holding a jade pendant in his hand. The pendant was carved in the shape of a mandrill. Ha! Such a fine Kai. The bull commented as his eyes glowed eerie green. I wonder who is sending me all of these masters from the other side. I have to make sure to thank them when I return. He said with a chuckle. Hum. He hummed and looked at Monkey King, his eyebrow raised in interest. Especially you. You have an amazing amount of Kai, and the quality is refined. The bull commented, maybe I will finally be able to best Ugwe after taking your Kai. The Monkey King did not know what was happening, but he got ready to fight. The bull who was yet to be introduced, spun his chains and threw his green blades at him. A fight began, much to the Monkey King's horror, who thought he would be able to slack at least in the afterlife. Alas, he was wrong. Kai was getting stronger. He was slowly but surely getting even stronger than his canon counterpart. Because even though he did not get Tai Lung's Kai, many other masters who did not die in canon were all dying. With the upcoming wars that Tai Lung was about to wage, surely many more Kung Fu masters would be sent into the spirit realm. It was only a matter of time until Kai became unstoppable. Although Tai Lung was getting strong, his ultimate enemy was also doing the same. Tai Lung had broken the first part of the prophecy. Will he be able to break free from the second part? Will his legacy truly die at the hands of Kai? The inevitable battle was drawing near. One that would shake the heavens and shake the universe. Tai Lung's POV the fun and easy part in my opinion of conquering a new kingdom had come to an end. Now, it was time for the political and boring parts. Obviously, you can't just defeat the army of S kingdom and wash your hands, thinking you are done with it. But it was for times like these that I formed an alliance with Shen, so I left everything in his hands. He had been in his throne room, writing hundreds of files and scrolls, because apparently, you can't just announce the new rules and regulations that the kingdom is going to follow. Shen also had to change the constitution of the kingdom, and shape it to his liking, before he passed down the authority to the previous royals again. My army on the other hand was busy creating new cannons with the available resources of the kingdom, so I could not train them yet. That left me no duties on my shoulder. Which didn't mean that I had nothing to do as I still needed training with my newly acquired ability, which was controlling Kai outside of my body. I will be visiting the Jade Palace to get some training in before our next battle. I said to Shen, who was sitting in the throne room of the previous king. The place was filled with different scrolls and paper to paint the image of a scholar's den. How long will you be gone? Shen asked immediately, because even though I said that to him, 
I was not asking for permission and merely notifying him. As long as you are still busy with all of these. I said and referred to all of the scrolls. A shame. He said with a sad sigh. I rather enjoyed your presence. It is not often for me to do so as I barely have friends in my life. Wait as far as I know, you are the only one. He said with an earnest smile. Cut the bullshit. I know the real reason you want me to stay is to ensure safety in case the other kings decide to attack before things settle down. I said, perhaps. But who said there has to be only one reason I want you to stay? You don't have to worry about it. We respect the codes of war, and so will they. I said in a firm tone. That is quite naive coming from you. It's not naive. It's called having an honor. I said, and even if they decided they no longer want to respect the codes of war, they will quickly change their mind on the matter, after I drop into their capital city, and turn it into hell. I see. Shen smiled, that assures me a little. I grunted in reply, as he should. They will be the ones who suffer if the codes of war are discarded. So, what is the main problem that you are having that it made even your mind stagnant? I asked curiously when I saw the dark circles under his eyes. I knew he was working hard. But was it to the point that he didn't even sleep? He sighed, it's everything. I have to make sure everything is perfect. So that our empire will not crumble in the future. I need to force order to the kingdom and give the previous ruler his power back. While making sure that they wouldn't rebel in the future. The king might want his revenge. The nobles have their own agenda for the sake of profit. And the citizens are in chaos. Opinions clashed. Shen said with a shake of his head. Sounds rough. It is. Shen said. But he smiled at the end. I like the trouble though. It's a constant reminder of our success. The first step to the impossible. I just need to implement a new system of government first before anything else. He said with a thoughtful hum. Why don't you let the citizens choose their ruler? I blurted out when I heard he needed a system of government. Shen paused. What? Nah, forget about it. I said with a shrug. The idea of democracy or something similar would be too foreign for them. It was a bad idea. I just named the most popular government of the modern world. When he said he needed a government system. No. Shen said and his eyes went wide and focused. I could literally see his mind working faster than most would even thought possible. Yes. He draws and nodded. Yes, it could work. Why don't I let the people choose their ruler? He repeated. That will shift their focus and they would be busy debating on who should rule them, rather than if it was a good idea to be under us. It will give them a new thing to chew on. Quote, and why not let the noble houses be eligible to be the rulers? So conflicts between them and the king, so that revenge against us will be a distant dream. Those nobles will never let go of a chance to rule, of course. They will still be ultimately under us. But our presence won't matter much if we are constantly expanding our empire. I did not think that far, but sure. Anyways, if that's done I will be leaving. I said. Oh of course, Shen said with a smile. Although the idea of you training when you are already this strong is quite a horrifying idea. I wish you luck. I gave a final nod before I went out of the room and leapt out of the balcony. I leapt into the air and propelled myself upwards and shot across the sky. It didn't take me long to reach the Jade Palace. Boom. The ground shook as I did a superhero landing on the training ground. I stood up just in time for the Furious Five and Poe to run out of the training hall to see me. Well, yellow there juniors. Master Tai Lung Po was the first one to run up to me followed by the others. Oh my gosh. We've heard the news. You are so fucking awesome. Po said and raised his arm. Tell me, tell me. What was it like? Did you have to go all out? Or were the 50,000 soldiers just a warm up for you? Is it true that the Monkey King is dead? Monkey asked me as he came up from behind. How are the citizens of Shu? Are there any problems with the new administration? Crane asked thoughtfully. Welcome home. Tigress was the only one without question as she folded her arm and looked at me with a smile. I raised my hand to stop all the chattering and questions. They went silent and I stared at them with my intense eyes. You guys are talking a lot. Let's see if you can do more than that. I said and stomped on the ground as a gust of wind erupted from me, blowing them away. I came back to the Jade Palace to train, and what better way to do so than spar with these six. It will not only help me but help them as well. It's a win-win situation. Besides, I wanted to see how much they improved, especially Tigris and Poe. Instead of telling, let me show you how I took down an army by myself. I chuckled and cracked my neck before I blurred from my position and grabbed Crane's neck. He was the only one that could fly and the main brain of the team, so he should be taken out first. Why always me question Mark Tilda Crane choked out as I slammed him on the ground. The spa slash training started. Tai Lung's POV Kai. The fuel of miracles. If you were amazed at what I could achieve with it when it was limited inside of my body. 
You would be horrified to learn what I could do with it, now that I can control and shape it to my liking outside of my body. It brought my combat prowess to a whole new realm. Obviously, it was not usable in a real fight with my current proficiency, because a battle of my caliber happened in the blink of an eye, and one millisecond could dictate death and victory. But when I finally mastered the use of my kai to such a level that I could use it during battle, then I will confidently declare that I stood shoulder to shoulder with the likes of Ugwe. The same principles applied to my Kai when it was outside of my body, and it meant that just like before, I was extremely versatile and creative with the way I was using my Kai. I did more than just grow trees or make a dragon construct which I can shoot around. I can do something like this. I said to myself with a smile. I brought my hands up and from my palm, a blue flame was burning with frightening intensity. There was one world that came to my mind when I realized I could control my Kai when it was outside of my body and affect the world around me. The world of Avatar, the warriors there were capable of manipulating the four elements and their variants to their will. Without the proper guidance, I had a hard time achieving the same feats as they did, but I was slowly getting there. I was learning through trial and error, but it wouldn't be long until I could bend the elements as they did in their world. Sometimes, I would forget that you are a monstrous genius, and times like this are a reminder, Schiffer commented as he stood not too far away. He had been supervising my training since the very start, and I allowed him because it was very helpful to him. He had already attained inner peace, so mastering Kai was his next journey too. Really? I asked the question with an obvious answer while I clenched my fist to put out the flames. Yes. I've never heard of or seen Master Ugwe achieve such impossible feats semicolon, like conjuring blue flames, creating a rotating ball of energy that can destroy boulders or that technique you made recently, the one that ruptured a mountain, Shifu said with a curious stroke of his beard. He must be talking about my firebending, Rasengan and the last one. These techniques are something you created in only a week of training as well. The potential you hold is something that will terrify any master, my son. Shifu said and the smile on his face could not have been prouder. Has it already been a week again since I came to the Jade Palace? It feels way shorter when you are busy putting all your mind into training. I have not even had a wink of sleep yet as I meditated instead, trying to get a better feel of my Kai, or otherwise just letting my body interact with my Kai. Of course. But you only name techniques which are destructive in nature. You can't only have destruction, sometimes you need to heal and give life. I said and put out my hand near the small seedling plant on the ground. I willed my Kai outside my palm, and it released a bluish glow. My Kai affected the small plant, and I allowed it to grow. Not long after, the plant grew and turned into a beautiful flower. What was used as an energy to fuel destruction, can also be used to fuel life. You can change the nature of your Kai according to your will. But one thing I noticed was that whenever I was using my Kai, if it was to fuel destruction, my white Kai would react enthusiastically, whereas my blue Kai seemed more fluid when I was about to fuel a restoration or healing technique. A curious thing, but in the end, they need to be equal output to work, so it didn't really matter. That was one thing which annoyed the shit out of me. I needed to focus on my Kai, and make sure that they were in equal proportion or the technique will not work. The more unequal they are, the harder it is to control. That means at the moment, I cannot use Kai outside of my body on instinct. Which means I cannot utilize it in real combat just yet. I would need someone to distract my enemy, so that I can have enough time to concentrate to execute my technique. In that regard, I was kind of like a mage who needed some time to create spells. That, I can do too. Shifu said with a smile before he did the same thing, making a flower grow until it blooms. That was all he could do though. Strangely enough, neither Po nor Shifu had been able to replicate any of the techniques I took from my knowledge of another world. I could understand my father, but for Po to be unable to copy my techniques too, it made me believe I may be special for a moment. It could just be their incompetence though, rather than being impossible for anyone else but me to achieve such things. It left me with myriads of questions again. The initial reason why I could invent such techniques was because I have the knowledge and because I have seen other people perform it in my past life. So I thought inventing was my only advantage. I thought other people would eventually be able to copy my techniques as well after they see me do it. But that seemed to be not the case so far. I need further time to test my theory though. If it is true then that means there was something special about me which others didn't have. Kai was the fuel of miracles, and I have been able to achieve impossible things with it. I wonder was it not the same for other people? Maybe it is but was mine more potent because I have two Kai. Where are the students? 
I asked as I could not hear them close by. I also took in the air and analyzed the different scents in the air. Theirs were absent. I have sent them on a mission. Bandits and pirates have been very active in the west after the fall of Shu. So I sent them there to deal with it. I raised my eyebrow and my ears poked up. I did not hear any such news while I was in there. I said with a low growl. If bandits and pirates were terrorizing my land. It was my responsibility to deal with them, not the students of the Jade Palace. Obviously they are not suicidal. They would have never attacked if you stayed there. They started making moves only when they realized you were gone. I clicked my tongue. My status was at the point where my mere presence had a nig effect even if I didn't do anything. The things I could do were enough to scare my enemies off. No need to get all upset. Your junior can handle it easily. And I thought it would be better to not disturb you with such things. While you were in the middle of training, Shifu said, Thank you. Although it was unfortunate that Poe was not here, I was planning on finally revealing the hidden panda village which still exists today, and his father who was continuously looking for him. I thought it would be good for Poe to have a family reunion, and relearn the ways of a panda without Kai looming above their fate. Oh well, I could just do that when he returns. Father. I called out much to the surprise of Shifu, but it was because I wanted to request something. Mind a light sparring, I asked. Calling me father only when you have something you want from me. Spare this old panda's feelings, he said with a fake sad face. It is what it is, I said. He was going to accept my proposal anyway, even if I did not call him father. I launched myself at him as we started having a light sparring which quickly escalated to a small fight. First rule of martial arts, there is no light sparring. It is a myth. I have been learning so many new techniques in the only span of one year, that it nearly got to the point that it nearly had a negative effect on my combat power. Many people would assume that since I have learned so many powerful techniques, I would be so much stronger. But in truth, I was indeed stronger. But not by much. It is like giving a machine gun to someone who has been using a pistol all his life. Of course, a machine gun was better, but the sheer proficiency he had with a pistol before made it, so that the difference was not much. This will continue until he becomes as proficient with the machine gun as he was with the pistol. Likewise, I have been changing up my fighting style and adding multiple new techniques, which while making me stronger, was not at its fullest potential. I needed more experience, so a fight or a spa like this was always welcomed. We continued fighting for half a day, exchanging blows as we fought in the sky, on the hill, on the training ground etc. We would have gone one if not for the messenger bird that suddenly decided to pay a visit. He had a letter for me. Who was the one that sent you? I asked as I took the message scroll from his hand. I quickly opened up to read the contents while he answered. It's from Lord Shen, Great General Tai Lung. My eyes narrowed as I quickly read the contents of the scroll, and the permanent scowl on my face deepened. A soft yet big growl rolled off my throat and vibrated out into the surroundings. It made the air around me flee as a cold wind blew over the place. Really now, I said as I crushed the scroll in my hand. Shifu who was standing beside me and was also peeking at the letter, had a worried look wash over his face. My anger swiftly got tainted with slight amusement as dark chuckles rolled off my throat. A consecutive attack on both the capital of Shu and Gongmen City. The armies are marching towards us right now. Yes, armies. The other kingdoms have united. Third POV, three weeks ago, in the southernmost city of the kingdom Nanzao, an important meeting unlike anything that had ever happened before was taking place. The building was the castle of the city, but the weird thing about it was that everything was quiet, which meant that there were not many people in that castle even though it was massive. There were no servants, there were no soldiers, and there were no residents. In the main room of the castle, seven people were occupied with each other, and they were also the only people in the whole castle. There was a palpable tension in the air. The presence of these individuals was so massive that it took over the whole castle, making the empty rooms have the weight of being occupied. There was silence, but their presence was so heavy that anyone would be able to tell that someone was in the castle. So, is anyone going to say something or are we going to continue observing each other and wait for the other to attack? Said a tiger who had a robust physique, but his scholar clothes would tell you that he was not a warrior. He was just blessed with a great body and supernatural strength since birth. He was the king of the South Kingdom Dali. I think it's for the bird to decide. He was the one who called this meeting. I was going to reject it at first, but he promised in the name of his kingdom 
that it was going to be worth a while, said a crocodile wearing a luxurious golden robe. His scales also have rubies and golden webs between them to show his wealth. He was the king of the central kingdom Tang. Could you please get to the point quickly? I have my harem to attend to. The tiger, the king of Dali said with a tired yawn. That seemed to show his carefree attitude, which was exactly opposite to how he actually felt. I am glad you can all make it. The golden pheasant, the king of Nanzao said. This was the other plan that he had besides giving orders to Mighty Eagle. He was about to do something drastic to make sure that Lord Shen and Tai Lung were forever gone from this world. That was how much of a threat they posed to the world, at least in his eyes. Getting the two kings in one room was no easy feat. However, he was somehow able to do it. An event like this where more than two kings had a meeting was 20 years ago. So it was not a common occurrence at all. Though the kings were accompanied by their general and their strongest warrior, the bird king of Nanzao, eyed the two warriors who stood behind their respective kings. They were strong, but he was not outdone by them as behind him was Master Eagle, also known as Mighty Eagle. He was simply standing there, but his whole presence seemed to loom over them as the two warriors the kings brought seemed to be on edge. So when he spoke, the king of Nanzao did so with confidence. I want to form an alliance. Silence. Then laughter. Ha 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 ha. The tiger and the crocodile. The king of Dali and the king of Tang started laughing hysterically as the sound echoed through the empty castle. The laughter was not fake or overdone either. It was genuine. Oh god please don't tell me that's why you called us both here. The tiger said between laughter, this is too goddamn funny. Do you take us for fools oh great golden pheasant? Ha ha ha. I came here wondering what the falling king wanted at his deathbed. But this is just ridiculous, the crocodile said, wiping his tears. The Falling King, the kings of Dali and Tang were no fools. They knew that Lord Shen and Tai Lun were coming after Nanzao next, after they conquered Chu. There were ten powers in China before which were the ten kingdoms. Now, things have changed slightly with Shu being taken over by Shen. Although Shu lost many of its soldiers, Shen's weapon made it so that it was still a proper power. And then there was the new 11th power of China, Tai Lung the Walking Kingdom. So if you think about it, it's two great powers versus one. Therefore the kingdom of Nanzao has a very low chance of defending itself against Lord Shen and Tai Lung. That was why he was called a fallen king. Now, he wants the three of them to form an alliance, so that they can fight against Shen and Tai Lung. No chance. If they did decide to form an alliance, it would be three great powers versus two, and they have the advantage. But it won't be an easy war to win either. They will lose all of their resources. Or the King of Dali and the King of Tang can wait until the end of the war between Lord Shen and Tai Lung with the Kingdom of Nanzao. Then in the aftermath, when the winner is at its weakest they will strike. With enough preparation, Nanzao will be able to put up a decent fight, unlike the Shu who was caught off guard. So Tai Lung and Shen will suffer many losses even if they win. That will be a great time to swoop in and reap all of the advantages, with the least amount of lost. So why, why in the heaven and earth would they want to ally with the kingdom of Nanzao? When not allying with them will give more reward with minimum lost. No, to the king of Dali and Tang said in unison, as they rejected the proposal for an alliance. Not only was it not beneficial to them, an alliance between kingdoms had not happened in a thousand years. There was nearly one twenty years ago. But that was stopped by Tai Lung before a great war starts. The answer is and has always been obvious. No. Oh well, too bad then. The king of Nanzao, a golden pheasant said, I would have preferred forming an alliance with you two, instead of surrendering to Shen and Tai Lung. Such a sad thing. The bird said with a sigh, but there was a smile on his face. What? The king of Dali said out loud, proving himself to be the worst king at hiding his true emotions between them. So he was planning to surrender to the enemy without even fighting them. That changes everything. Now, if there was no fight between them, how would they take advantage of the aftermath and strike when Shen and Tai Lung are weak? Forget about them being weak, it would make them much stronger with the army of Shu and Nanzao under their banner. If that happens, Tai Lung and Shen would continue expanding their power immediately. And who were they coming next? It was them. The Kingdom of Dali and the Kingdom of Tang will be their next victim as the kingdom closest to them. That realization sent a chill down the king's spine. The king of Nanazhao basically said, double it and give it to the next person. Have you no honor? The king of Dali, Tiger asked. In his eyes, surrendering to an enemy even without fighting back was the most cowardly thing a king or warrior could do. Even if you were weaker, die trying and go out in glory. So the kingdom of Nanzao surrendering was not even a possibility he considered. My honor lies in ensuring the future of my kingdom. The bird said, 
I also heard that Shen is actually appointing the previous rulers to continue ruling the kingdom. The only difference will be that they will be under the authority of Shen and Tai Lun. It might even mean getting into their good side, so I do not mind giving up like a coward. If it saves the lives of my people, so be it. I am not sending my soldiers to die in a battlefield that promised no victory. The room went quiet as they listened to his words. Although his action was not traditional, they had respect for his beliefs and motives. So, what's it going to be? The king of Nanzao asked again. If I don't win, I will make sure both of you don't either. If I lose, I will drag you both with me. That was basically what the situation was. Both of the kings know that if Nanzao actually surrenders without a fight, there will be three powers against them. Army of Nanzao, Tai Lung and Lord Shen with his army and weapons. They won't win, that's for sure. Cunning bastard. The crocodile said with a shake of his head. Let's talk about how we are going to divide the spoils and the lands first. He continued with an annoyed smile. That was all but a confirmation that they would likely accept the proposal. In the end, they were able to settle on the rewards in a way that all of them were satisfied. The kingdom of Nanzao will get the entirety of the land of Shu. But in return, she would give some of her territory to the kingdom of Dali. The lands which the Dali were always envious of would be theirs. And Tang will get Gongman City. The land was not massive, but the economy was something that would be arguably more beneficial. I accept the alliance. I accept the alliance. After a thousand years, three of the ten kingdoms have united against a common enemy. There was no doubt in their mind that they would win with this. Tai Lung is the main problem here, as he alone has strength that could rival a kingdom. We take him out, and then the rest would be much easier, said the bird, King of Nanza. Any plans? Crocodile said, King of Tang, we will march towards Gongman City and try to capture it. Most of Lord Shen's forces are in Shu right now, so the army will not be able to come in time to defend it. In this case, Tai Lung will be forced to protect the city, said the bird. We will send a huge portion of our forces to Gongman City, along with our most powerful warrior, Mighty Eagle, Master Waterdle and Master Tiger. Then we make sure to take out Tai Lung for good. A walking kingdom cannot be allowed to exist. You mean we march towards a city full of civilians, and that too without notifying the rulers, so that they could deploy forces to defend it. That would be a war crime and a breach in the codes of war, said Tiger, the king of Dali. Igwe is dead so small breach like this could be overlooked. It's not a huge war crime like poisoning the enemy's food source either so we should be fine. And are you sure you want to let Tai Lung grow until he becomes like Ugwe? If we don't kill him not that's what he will become. Wait the bird said. Right. There will be no one to complain after we are done either. Said the crocodile. The meeting went on for a few days until the plans were finalized. It has been decided. And then the three kingdoms made their move. Tai Lung's POV. What is it son? Shifus's voice brought me out from the dark side of my thoughts. Three kingdoms have united, Nanzao, Dali and Tang. They have decided to launch an all-out attack on us. I said and put down the scroll. That's Shifu draws in shock. I could not blame him as it was truly astonishing that three kingdoms had formed an alliance which had not happened in a thousand years. It was not rare for two kingdoms to team up against one kingdom, in which case the enemy also allies with another to counter this force. That would make it a war in which four kingdoms participated, and more than that would be a direct breach of the codes of war. That was why this situation was new and dangerous. Will you be okay? Shifu disregarded all the other questions swirling in his mind, and that was the first sentence he uttered after hearing the news. His voice laced with concern would have made me blush if anger was not boiling under my skin. I'll be fine. I said, but will they? The scroll stated that a huge army which consisted of these three kingdoms was already making their way to Gongman City and would reach there in less than three days. For reference, I took five days to reach Gongman City from central China, where Tang was located. I was already fast and with their army, they should have taken triple that time. Yet Shen said he only found out a few days ago, and was not even aware that they had formed an alliance. So he just thought they were moving their army to the border of their territory to prepare for us. So it was a sneak attack, something which directly goes against the codes of war. An alliance of three kingdoms should have been announced immediately. Even the alliance between Shen and I was announced to the world the very next day. Their action was not to the point that it could be called a serious war crime, and they should face the consequences. But it was also not innocent. If I had to make a comparison, it was like dirty boxing which the referee did not notice. So I was angry, which was not good for anyone. Because then I will not fight to win, but to hurt. I will be leaving now. It's unfortunate that our time had to be cut like this. I said, but before I walked away, I discussed something extremely important with Shifu. The conversation was not long though as I left soon after. Messenger, I called the pigeon, 
and he came to me with uncertain steps. Yes, my lord. Fly back to Shen and tell him to focus on defending Shu. I said, Gongmen is safe. Then I leapt into the air and using flash steps, I made my way to the metropolis city which once rejected me. They want to take over Gongmen city. They will do no such thing while I am breathing. Even if I have to bear the might of the three great powers, it will not happen. Floosh. My body sliced through the atmosphere as I used the intangible as a foothold. A snow leopard was not meant to fly, one warrior was never meant to face an army, and a villain was never meant to protect. But I did anyway. I care not of what was or is meant to be. No physical trait, no logic or label would define me. I surpass all. I am Tai Lun. My legs stilled as I stopped using flash steps. But not only was I not falling, but the speed at which I flew was faster. I used Hing Kong to make myself weightless as I bent the air around me, so that it pushed me forward. I was unshackled and free. I am a master of Kai, so I flew. Third POV. The army from Nanzhao is slowly marching and invading our territory. The soldiers stationed at the Bantong River were defeated. Whilst Wolf reported to Shen, How are we going to proceed my lord? Should we continue playing defensive or should we launch an attack while disregarding Gongmen City? The attack from Nanzhao came from the furthest side of the west, which meant that if Lord Shen were to send his army to repel the invaders, it would be impossible to march back and reach Gongmen in time to save it. So right now, Shen has not deployed his army yet and is waiting for the news from the messenger. Splitting his army into two was a choice, but that would make his chance of victory plummet massively. Even if he were to match the invading force of Nanzhao with half his army, the enemy kingdom would just send more forces and double down, knowing the other half of Shen's army went to defend Gongmen city. And the army he sent to Gongmen would only reach the city, when the soldiers who remained there to protect the city, were heavily weakened, making it almost impossible to take back the city. It was a well-planned strategic attack which was crafted to make Shen completely helpless. Even the cunning bird would have actually been left helpless had he not allied with Tai Lung. But he was, so there was hope. Send the gorillas to create obstacles. Use the explosives to cause a landslide or collapse some mountains. I don't care. Just make sure to slow down their movements. Shen said his voice would have been frustrated and angry a few months ago but he was eerily calm right now. That was because what was happening was something within Shen's expectations. He was not frustrated and instead B was actually pleased with the development. Things were getting annoying as it was hard for the people of Shu to accept Shen and Tai Lung as their new rulers. But this attack gave them an opportunity to make it, so that the people would accept. If they were to come out victorious and successfully defend the land, it would cause the people of Shu to have a change of heart. After all, you can't hate your savior. And it will also instill loyalty to the army of Shu. What else would be better to cultivate their loyalty, than leading them to victory against their main rival which was Nanza? There was always a silver lining in every situation, and Shen was experienced in finding that silver lining. Just look at how he took over Gongmen city after Tai Lung destroyed his dot warehouse. Or how he formed an alliance with him instead of making him an enemy when he captured his students. But the silver lining in this situation will only happen if they somehow come out victorious in this conflict. Which Lord Shen was sure would be the case. Because he was not alone anymore in his fight against the world. Tell me, have you gotten information on the forces that is currently heading towards my city? Shen asked and Boss Wolf lowered his head in shame and hesitance. No dot dot my, lord. We do not know the exact numbers as none of our scouts returned. But we suspect it to be massive, and all of the three allied kingdoms had sent their army. He said, the fact that none of our bird scouts have returned also indicated that Mighty Eagle is amongst them killing off every aerial animal. So their main focus is taking over Gongmen City, huh? The attack from Nanzhao is likely meant to be a distraction. Lord Shen thought to himself, it was a great move from the enemy which was applaudable. If they take over Gongmen City, then the army would have an extremely easier time invading Shu, as they would just have to follow Shen's previous path. The walls and the defensive towers Shen felled in his quest to conquer Shu, had still not been restored, so they must be planning to invade from the already cleared path. Have Master Ox and Croc reached Gongmen City? Shen inquired to which he got an affirmation. As the guardian of the city, Master Ox and Croc were the first to run back to the city to protect it. They must be feeling extremely guilty and complicated which was exactly what Shen wanted. They were the ones who provided the information that Tai Lung left Shu to the enemies. There was no other explanation for how well-timed the attack from the Three Kingdoms was. As mentioned before, the Kung Fu Council was the ally of any enemy that Shen had. They must feel betrayed as the Kung Fu Council was helping the kingdoms capture Gongmen City. Lord Shen was already pushing it. But they could understand since he was the heir, but they would not allow the city to be used and owned by the other kingdoms. After this, Shen hoped that they would be loyal to him. They were valuable warriors. 
and although at first he kept them alive to control the flow of information the enemy received, it would be better if they completely became his. Lord Shen and Boss Wolf continued discussing different matters. Shen went through reports after reports and quickly thought of a solution to any problem that arises. But their talk was interrupted by the sound of flapping wings coming from the balcony. The messenger which Shen sent to Tai Lung has returned. Did you find him? Shen asked the messenger immediately. Yes, my lord. And he have received your scroll. So, General Tai Lung said to focus on defending Shu, and that Gongman is safe. Shen started laughing madly when he heard that. He was expecting Tai Lung to request at least a few thousand soldiers, but it seemed he was planning to do things alone again. Tai Lung will only have the army stationed at Gongmen to repel off the invading forces of the Three Kingdoms. The damned felony was as crazy as him. But fine, Rod Shen will trust him. Did you hear what your Supreme General said? Stop worrying about Gongmen and gather up the army to face against the Nanza. Shen said to Boss Wolf. We are going to take over Nanza. Shen said with an evil smile. Defend Shu. That was what Tai Lung had said. But how can Shen not surpass his expectations when he had surpassed Shen's expectations multiple times? They wanted to take his city from him, but instead, he will take over their kingdoms, while they are busy fighting against Tai Lun. But for that, he will need to bring out his new weapon, a weapon he had created with the idea Tai Lung had given him, bring out the airships. The three kingdoms had made a move and launched an attack to destroy Tai Lung and Shen, but now they will fight back. The war begins. Tai Lung's POV I flew above Gongmen City, and carefully observed it from afar. Just like you would expect a city which was about to be invaded to react, they were doing it. The city was in absolute chaos. While the city itself was eerily quiet with the citizens locking themselves up in their houses, waiting for the disaster to pass by some miracle, the exit gate of the city was packed, as many people wanted to leave the city. Both were an understandable reaction to the impending battle. While the citizens were going to be unharmed in the upcoming conflict, if the codes of war were followed, their new rulers would more likely than not demand war tax from them. This was especially likely for Gongmen City, which was the home of many rich animals from all over China. And the fact that Trad had stopped in the city was a huge turn off to most resident. So these people wanted to move out of the city as quickly as possible. I ignored the city itself and made my way to the army barracks which was stationed a little far away from the city. When I finally reached there, I stopped using my Kai and fell to the ground like an asteroid. Boom. I crashed into the earth as my feet were planted deep into the ground. But I showed no reaction, and I easily stepped out of the crater. The army quickly came out of the camps with their weapons, ready to kill any invader. But they stilled on their spot when they saw me. I took a look around the barracks, and immediately noticed the sober mood of the place. A soldier's barracks should be lively like a tavern, as there were none who were more appreciative of life and every day than soldiers who walked with death each day. But the barracks which I stood at was the opposite of what you would expect. It felt more like a hospital or a graveyard, with the ghosts of negative feelings haunting the place. Why are you guys so quiet? Are you all scared? I asked the wolves with a small smile on my face. The majority of the army who were left in Gonjman City were directly under Lord Shen and me. They were also the ones whom I spent a week training, so they were the closest soldiers to me. I let my Kai erupt out and started affecting the environment. It was like a drop of rain falling on a pond and creating small waves that spread out everywhere. My will pressed down on the surroundings, and even if they didn't see me, everyone in the vicinity was told of my presence. It was not one of threat but a reassuring one. They had nearly been forced to a fate where they would fight an impossible battle they would never win, so their dull mood and eerie barracks was understandable. But that stops now. Be not afraid. I said, my voice infused with Kai was carried by the wind to every ear. Your general is here. Wu -er -er Lord Tai Lung. The soldiers all came out and erupted into cheers. Their previously dull eyes now held a spark of hope. They must have heard of my tales even from Gongman City. So seeing me was a huge relief in their heart. These were the times when reputation became a vital weapon. Because with only my presence and a few words, I was able to turn their situation, their reality upside down, and boost their morale. Turn despair into hope, fear into courage, and anxiety into excitement. The first battle in a war takes place in the heart of the soldiers. And that was one. Tai Lung's POV it took me only a few hours to reach Gongman City from the Jade Palace which means I had around three days to prepare for the enemy to reach us. I gathered all of the soldiers in the barracks, and gave them a short speech to boost their morale, before telling them to get ready to march east. We will meet the enemy beyond the Pearl Lake. After I was done, I went to the city, and with the help of some of the noble houses there, I was able to calm down the people from panicking too much. With my reputation, it was not hard for them to believe that I would be able to protect them and defeat the army. The Supreme General was here, 
they told themselves. But many people still insisted on leaving the city. Trade had also stopped for a while now, and the economy of the city was quickly plummeting. Is this what you want? I asked while I ate the fish dish before me. I was in Mr. Lee's restaurant again, and Officer Chaucer looked like Chef was also there with me. He did not know how to react to the situation. I thought that with all the things the city has done for you, at least you would have the honor and not go this far. I said to Gazelle who was lying on the ground paralyzed from her neck down. She owned almost all of the brothels and male entertainment in Gongmen City. So when Shen took over the city, he decided to let her stay and operate under him. She was always more independent than she was with the Kung Fu Council. So we decided to let her stay in the city as her value outweighed her annoyance. It was similar to how we kept Master Ox and Croc alive and fighting for us. Not only were they useful, they were a link to our enemy. As Sun Tzu said, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. I, I didn't do anything. She spat out in a voice still full of defiance. Do you take me for a fool, gazelle? I asked and used my feet to prop up her chin. Look at me. I told her and she did. Her eyes started shaking, and her paralyzed body trembled. Like it was mentioned before, she had the innate ability to observe a person's strength. It was almost like how prey could differentiate predators from the rest. She already said I was the strongest person she had ever seen last time. But now that I had gotten stronger again, and also learned to control my Kai properly, I wonder what she saw. Say that again while looking at me. She couldn't. I'm curious. You have everything to gain if you work with us. So why did you decide to make yourself an enemy? I thought you were not even that close with the Kung Fu Council. I asked. She was born and lived in Gongmen City, and the reason she even associated with the Kung Fu Council in the first place was because they became rulers of the city. So it was a genuine question why she decided to still work with them. Go to hell. She grits her teeth. Wow, I felt some hate in her voice. Is it personal then? Don't tell me you were secretly in love with Master Rhino, and you now want to avenge him or something. I said with a laugh, and her reaction made me feel like that might be true. Or was it just her acting, choosing to make this the truth to avoid telling the real reason? The whore falls in love with the ruler of the city, but she never even had the courage to show her feelings, because she feels unworthy. She never allows herself to be touched by him because she thinks she will taint him and believes that her love for him is special and not lust. But then Sheng killed him before she even confessed blah blah blah. Sounds like a really shitty novel. I continued to entertain her for a bit more minutes before my plate finally became empty. And with my fish gone, so was my pleasant mood. I grabbed Gazelle by her horns and threw her across the restaurant. She crashed into the wall and fell to the ground. She immediately coughed out blood. I pushed her head down on the ground and used my claws to cut the floor in front of her. Now here is what we are going to do. I said quote, you are going to tell me everything that I want to know. Starting with how strong the alliance between the three kingdoms are, how many soldiers are marching towards the city, and how many masters are coming with them. She glared at me. I always thought she was someone clever, but maybe hatred had made her dumb. But the glare will quickly turn into one of submission soon. To know your enemy was half the battle won. Luckily, there was a literally walking meat of information under me. As the result of this battle would dictate the fate of everything. I cannot take any chances. I will not lose. Tai Lung's POV 200,000 soldiers. Now, that is not a funny number. That was probably the whole military might of two entire kingdoms. The reason why there were so many foot soldiers was mostly because of Tang, which was located in the center of China. The Jade Palace was there so central China was the most peaceful part of China. Therefore they had more infantry compared to other kingdoms. Since there was no constant war where they could lose soldiers, but in return, their soldiers were less experienced. But they should not be underestimated. It was an incredibly reckless move to dispatch 200,000 strong warriors to take over one city, even if they expected me to protect said city. Nay, reckless was not enough. It was a straight up insane move. So what could they possibly achieve with 200,000 soldiers? That number was so staggering that it would be more inconvenient rather than helpful. Instead, it would even be better to dispatch 50,000 soldiers in waves rather than 200,000 soldiers at once. Unless... Their main objective was not to take over the land, but something else. A task that requires 200,000 soldiers attacking at once rather than your typical war. Hair. A crazed smile split my face. Their main objective was not to take over the city and launch an attack on Shu from there. No, it was never about the unmoving territory which they could conquer any time. Their true target was the Walking Kingdom Me. The main goal of the three allied kingdoms was not to take over Gongmen City. It was to kill me. Ha 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 my laughter spread throughout the restaurant and silenced every other sound. Gazelle was unconscious beside my feet as I had knocked her out after I learned everything I wanted. But that was not all. 
200,000 soldiers was not enough to kill me. Although I would never do it, fleeing after fighting with everything I had was a possible reaction. So they sent Mighty Eagle and other Kung Fu masters with them. Among all of the names Gazelle had given me, four of them stood out. 1. Master White Tiger, Arka the greatest warrior the strongest warrior in all of Dali. And he was an old rival of Tai Lun, one he had already humbled in the past. 2. Master Yuchao Wang, Arka the Turtle Monk the strongest warrior and guardian of the Tang Kingdom. He was one of the few students of Ugwe himself, and was said to be related to the creator of Kung Fu. His age is unknown. 3. Mighty Eagle, Arka Vanquisher of Armies or King of the Sky. He is the strongest warrior of Nanzao and a guardian. He was equal if not more powerful than the Monkey King himself. 4. Master Sloth, Arka the Brain of the Kung Fu Council. He was known for his intelligence rather than his strength. He is said to be the smartest commander in all of China. These people would be the final nail to the coffin in defeating me. With Mighty Eagle there, running away also became impossible even if I could fly. They really were going all out. They knew the main backbone was me, and they knew Lord Shen was someone they could deal with easily if I was gone. After learning exactly what enemy was marching my way, I realized it was a poorly hidden challenge towards me. They dared. I said as my eyes showed a threatening yellow. I wonder, do they really believe they can kill me with this? I admit. I would have stood no chance if it was before I mastered Kai. But now it was different. I had a chance to not only come out alive, but absolutely demolish them. But even then, it won't be easy. It was a challenge, an obstacle before me, and I was certain I would come out stronger than ever on the other side. So what else can I do as the strongest warrior except, except the challenge? I ordered the soldiers to take Gazelle and put her in prison while I went towards the Tower of Sacred Flames to prepare. The plan was still the same, me and the 2,000 soldiers under me would be fighting against the Allied Kingdom. And we won't be shy and play defensive either. We would march towards them and meet them head on like equals. I realized that it was no longer about protecting the city after learning their true motives. It would be all about kill or be killed. They wanted to kill me, huh? I hope they took a page from Wu Bao and came prepared to meet the same fate. Third POV, we're moving too slow. The turtle monk said, and that should say something coming from a turtle. E E L A X tilde he won't go anywhere. He has nowhere to hide, and he is not one to run either. Master White Tiger said with a carefree yawn. They were both standing at the peak of a tall mountain. It was early in the morning, and the clouds had come down from the sky so nothing below or behind them could be seen. But as they stood at the very peak of a mountain, the place was brightly lit up by the morning sun already. It's not the possibility of Tai Lung running away that bothers me so. It's the fact that we are giving him time to prepare for us. EFTT. So what? You afraid that it would cost us more soldiers than we thought? Master White Tiger scoffed. He only receives a side eye from the Turtle Monk. He cannot win. Master White Tiger said after a long stretch of silence. Why not? He thinned his lips before he answered in a solemn voice, because that would make him invincible. And no one is invincible in this world, not even Master Ugwe. Okay. The turtle monk nodded before turning away. They stood on top of the mountain for some time, basking in the morning sun until Master White Tiger's ears twitched. He turned his head to look behind him, and then something flashed above them. The speed at which the thing moved was so fast that it was not visible to the eye. It was almost like a phantom, but the proof of its existence came long after it had passed. A violent whirlwind came to life as it blew a shockwave everywhere. The clouds below them quickly dispersed due to the ray change in wind. After the clouds were gone, the ground below was finally revealed. A nigh infinite amount of soldiers stretched until the eye could see. They were like ants in an anthill, as their presence disrupts the very balance of nature itself. 200,000 soldiers were slowly marching towards Gongmin under the morning sun. Two more days. Master Altai Tiger mutters as he looks down at the army. At long last, he will finally be able to slay Tai Lun. Let us go. We cannot leave everything to Master Sloth after all. Turtle Monk said before he leapt into the air and fell towards the army below. The enemy draws near. Tai Lung's POV the sun breathing. It was a technique, a form of martial arts which I copied from the world of Demon Slayer. The main concept behind this enhancing technique was as the name implied. Using a unique pattern of breathing to make sure that you get the most amount of oxygen into your system, thereby increasing the limit of your body. Not only that, but after years of training the user can develop his own set of forms using his breathing technique, and true masters have shown other extraordinary abilities using this breathing style. I said it before, but after I copied this technique, I realized that it worked extremely effectively for my biology. 
as I had a stronger set of lungs than that of a human. Lungs which were meant to survive in extreme cold and high altitudes where oxygen was scarce. But even then, the enhancement the sun breathing gave me was almost negligible, as I could achieve the same thing by strengthening my body with Kai. The greatest boon the technique gave me was when it came to endurance, which is why you would see me use it during wars or drawn out battles. It was a great technique which can give me more stamina, and also enhance my body at a cheaper cost, than just using a shit ton of Kai. But still, it was never a technique on the level of a trump card like Flash Steps, Thunderclap or Internal Destruction. Well, that changed after I was finally able to master Kai. The first set of techniques I learned after I mastered Kai was the ability to bend elements. I took inspiration from the world of Avatar with these techniques. I was able to achieve similar feats as the benders from Avatar, but expectedly, I was not as good as them, and it would take me some time to get on their level. But nevertheless, being able to control elements no matter the degree of mastery was great. So I was happy with my achievement, even if I wouldn't be able to use it in a real fight soon. Well, that changed soon after the new discovery I made during my training these two passing day. Elemental bending, in specific fire bending and the sun breathing, went extremely well with each other to the point that together, they become usable in a real fight. It was the second time it happened where I was able to merge two techniques from different worlds. The first time was when I mixed Bleach Shumpo and Uck Holder Flash Steps to create a new variation of movement I called Flash Steps, which takes the best of both techniques. Now it happened again. Sun breathing by itself was not much, and I had not trained enough to master fire bending to be able to use it in a real fight. But together, I was able to achieve a level of fire bending, which I can only compare to the likes of Azula, since my flames were also blue. I guess it made sense since even in the original Avatar, it was stated that the power of fire bending comes from the breath and not muscles. And sun breathing seemed to have been created with the sole intention of boosting a firebender's ability. The feats I was able to achieve when I used both of these techniques together, were in the mildest word insane. Huru I realized a hot breath that produced smoke from my mouth as I concentrated on my sun breathing. A searing heat was emanating from my body. The temperature around me was hot enough to slowly melt the ground under me as waves of heat blew out like the wind. I sat with a cross leg in a meditation position as I tried to mix the sun breathing with my bending ability. I had ignored progress in other elements and focused only on fire these passing days. Ha! Huh, I released the budding energy inside me and my Kai turned into flames as it exploded out from my body like a wave, scorching my surroundings. I was sure my current situation would look extremely similar to some main character in a Chinese novel, who was cultivating in the ways of the Phoenix Heavenly Fire God. But who can blame me? I am Chinese so sue me. I laughed at my own thoughts as I relaxed my breathing. I was still using constant sun breathing, but it was mellowed out. It's done. I am ready. I said to myself before I stood up, I was currently in one of the mountains that surrounded Gongman City like a natural fortification. I had ordered my army to march ahead and go beyond the Peel Lake, but I stayed behind to get my last training in. But now, I am ready. Boom, the ground below me exploded violently as I blasted towards the sky like a rocket. Then I headed north to quickly catch my army which had marched ahead of me. They should not be meeting with the enemy army yet so I was not late. I was right on time. It took me less than an hour to reach my army as I covered what it took two days and minutes. My army below looked up in awe as I flew above them. I flew to the forefront of the army and landed with a controlled explosion. Report. They are 50 miles to the north. They have not made a move yet, as they take their time to rest before the real battle begins. One of the wolf commanders said to me immediately after I landed. I hummed in acknowledgement while I looked around at our 2B battlefield. The commanders had put up a defensive line just as I had instructed. My army stood its ground in a wide valley surrounded by tall mountains, as if it were a natural alley. Multiple cannons and their handler gorillas were also situated at the side of the mountain, so that they could rain down destruction upon our enemies. The valley was wide enough that we didn't have to fear landslides, and our army could fit perfectly without anyone getting in the way of each other. But for the enemy which would be 200,000 in number, it was too small. This would force them to attack us from the front with limited numbers instead of taking advantage of their number and surrounding us. This is good, I said with a satisfied nod. You did well Alpha. The commander nodded with a small smile on his face. I like him as he was one of the few who held genuine admiration for me even before I allied with Shen. I even gave him the nickname Alpha because I like him. 
and his original name was a mouthful. He was also a kung fu practitioner and one of the strongest soldiers in the army currently. I noticed him when I trained the army and immediately made him a commander even though he was quite young. He was only as old as Tigris and Po. Thank you general. He said with a bow. The place was filled with the presence of my army but it was not too loud to make sure it did not become disrespectful to me. The army consisted of wolves, foxes, gorillas and some big herbivores. I was currently at the far forefront of the army, and they were making small camps and huddled in groups behind them. They were chatting with each other, motivating each other and sharing courage. They wondered if they would survive to see the victory of this battle. And even if they didn't, they asked their friends to do this and that for them. All the while they sharpened their weapons and fixed their armor. Master Ox and Master Croc. I called out in a voice that held a certain edge. Both of them were doing their best to hide from me. But after I called them, they came out from amongst the masses and presented themselves before me. General Tai Lung. They addressed me and bowed down. I dealt with the two of them two days ago after I was done with Gazelle. I revealed to them that I had known about their betrayal long ago, and that I couldn't trust them. I put them in Gongmen jail with Gazelle, but they broke out of prison the same night, as we were lacking sufficient guard in prison to hold two Kung Fu masters. But unlike what you would expect, instead of running away they came to me and got on their knees before asking me to allow them to protect the city which they had sworn to protect. They felt betrayed that the people they were helping sought destruction and control over Gunman City, and they also felt guilty for inviting a disaster to the city. It was like a father bearing a deep desire to protect their child. It was their heavenly duty to protect it, and not doing so would be the same as destroying their honor. In the end, I allowed them to fight in the war since they were strong, and I could sympathize with them as a fellow master. So I allowed them one last battle before we decided what fate should befall them. I grant them permission to protect their honor and city. The two of you will not fight with the rest of the soldiers. I told them and pointed at the mountains. You will go through this mountain and wait for the enemy masters. There is no need to waste your energy on the common soldiers. That's what they want us to do. You two will keep the masters occupied until I deal with the big shots. Although this was a war, victory would be decided on who wins the fight between me and whoever they sent to fight against me. We all have the power to turn the tide of the battle alone, so the outcome of the battle directly depends in our fight. I just hope that my soldiers can hold the enemy until I grasp victory in my hand, as you command. Master Croc said while the one horn bull huffed. After that, we wait. But it was not a long wait as the sun finally sat on the west sky, signifying noon our enemy had reached us. The ground under our feet trembled as if a constant earthquake had cursed the world. The presence of 200,000 soldiers should not be underestimated as I felt the air grow hot and heavy with just their presence. When they finally entered the valley, the sight was despairing as it tested the walls of courage my soldiers had built up for three days. And I felt their courage and morale crumble when the enemy soldiers started beating their shields and armor as they chanted, Hail to the Allied Kingdom! Hail to the Allied Kingdom! Victory to the Allied Forces! Long live the Three Kingdoms! It was like thunder in the sky as their voices and steps shook the world. I could feel how my soldiers held their breath as one question loomed over their hearts. Can we really win this? Can we even survive? Doubts at a time like these could easily lead to defeat. I smiled as my eyes covered the distance between me and the enemy general. I locked eyes with Master Sloth who revealed a lazy smile while looking at us. A respectable strategy. Too bad he used it on Tai Lung and his army. Are you not scared Alpha? I asked the wolf commander beside me who was still as a rock. As long as you lead us. I don't know what to fear. He said with a cheeky smile. You really believe I can lead you to victory or are you just not afraid of death? I am afraid of death general, very much so. Do you know I have someone waiting for me back in the city? Her family moved out. But she decided to stay because in her words, she knew I will protect her. I want to live as long as she did so I can protect her and be with her. He said with a stupid smile. Like I said general, I am not afraid because I stand beside you. He said again. Are you sure it's not the rumors feeding your delusion? Are you really unafraid because I am here? It's not the rumors my lord. I have seen it with my own eyes. I was born and raised in the kingdom of Chu. And when I was a child, I saw you standing against every kingdom and stopping a great war by yourself. You saved me and my family that day. And because of that, we had the chance to move to Gongmen and start a new life there. He said and I heard his voice clearly even under the shouting of the enemies. So that was why he was such a fanboy. Flattering. Well, make sure you hold your weapon at all times. I said. I was not blushing, but it was close. 
He took out his sword and gripped it tightly in his hand, showing me that he won't let go. As you command general, I chuckled at the light exchange we had in front of the despairing enemy. I guess it's time for me to make a move and prove to you that your trust is not misplaced. I said with a smile. On my signal. I said. What signal? You will know. I said before I started walking towards the enemy army by myself. Formation I heard Alpha scream out as my army got ready for battle. I continued walking towards the enemy as all the eyes from my soldiers stuck on my back. I walked in a casual manner, as if I was not approaching literally thousands of enemies. Minutes passed and when I was far enough, I raised both of my hand in a T-pose, and I sucked in a huge amount of air. My chest expanded to a ridiculous degree as I utilized some breathing at its utmost potential. Some breathing and then... Fire bending there is a reason why I have been specifically training these two the world screamed, and the winds ran away as brilliant blue flames erupted out of my body like an angry volcano. Sounds ceased to exist burned away by my flames, and the thundering enemy was shocked to silence. Let the battle begin. Tai Lung's POV silence. The absolute lack of sound when more than 200,000 people occupied the space. It couldn't be put into words just how jarring that scene was. So there was silence. But it had more weight than a million words strung together by a poet. Silence was everything. It was fear. It was courage. It was disbelief. It was worship. It was despair. It was hope. It was the enemy and it was the hero. Then the world cried. It was not exactly a sound, but something high-pitched. It was a vibration you hear with your whole body. Blue flames blinded their sight. They were so bright and hot, they burned their eyes. There was no smoke because it burned everything, leaving no residue. The blue flames came from my body as they roared out in the silence of space. There was no other sound so it became everything. A looming noise, as if they were hundreds of feet underwater. It pressed on their eardrum like a heavy blanket. The enemy army held their breath, and those who were unfortunate enough to breathe, had to choke on the searing air, void of oxygen. They suffocated in silence. The reality stilled. The world was forced to bear a miracle. Sound returns only with my permission. I gave one word to the silence as it broke. Burn. I summoned the most destructive element in the world, and gave it order. The world was unsilenced and chaos emerged. The screams of the enemy cinched with the roaring sound of my flames, as it moved towards them like gigantic waves in the ocean. They didn't have time to run. Their legs wouldn't move to avoid the inevitable. They froze before the flames, yet their corpse would never know cold. I drove my arm forward as blue flames rushed out from my body. They shot at my enemy like a giant flamethrower, and burned everything without remorse. My fire covered the entire valley as it swallowed the entire frontier of the enemy battalion. Their numbers dwindled at great speed, but so did my Kai. I wouldn't be able to continue for long as I still need to fight a war. I needed to conserve as much Kai as possible. My fire looked like a second sun as it lit up the valley. I continued my attack for 10 whole seconds before I seized my action. Hey Alea, I released a breath and with it, the heat in my body. There was a pause, and then there were screams of fear and gasp of shock from the surroundings. What greeted me was the sight of charred land mixed with melted rocks like lava. I did not know how much I killed as their bodies were all reduced to ash. But I knew I brought down their number by at least four digits. But the greatest damage I did was on their morale. An evil smile spread across my face when I saw the enemy who were beating their shield and chanting like a victor not too long ago they wouldn't stop trembling. A look of horror paints their face. My soldiers on the other hand attack. They got my signal. For General Tai Lung for Gongmen City. My soldiers who were outnumbered a hundred to one, came charging at the enemy, as if they had all the advantage in the world. Their hopes have been reignited, their walls of courage strength. Ha 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 ha, I started laughing and I locked eyes with Master Sloth. Their formation was in absolute shambles, the soldiers were too stunned and scared to move properly. The least affected soldiers were still shaking too much to even wield their weapons properly. I released a roar and cracked my neck before I got down on all fours. Then I shot towards my enemy. My soldiers followed right behind me as a giant explosion erupted from the back. Multiple red streaks shot across the sky and landed to the back formation of the opposing army. There were explosions which sowed chaos amongst themselves. They ran. The 200,000 soldiers started running from the enemy 100 their number. Leaving so soon I roared out and and broke through their numbers, taking down the nearest soldiers I could find. I used flash steps to move through the army, as their body flew up into the sky, as if a train had ran through them. Rema, you guys are the one who invaded. I said to one leopard soldier as I held him by the neck. Then my soldiers finally reached the enemy, and slaughter ensued. This was just the start. Their numbers were too much to be defeated just like that, but for all it's worth we won the first battle. Kill them all for Gongmen City, for the Supreme General. 
Like always, wars are violent chaos. Third POV, we are losing, Master Sloth said with a tinge of disbelief. He was expecting this, or should he say he was expecting the unexpected when it came to Tai Lung. But the scene he just witnessed was beyond just the unexpected. It was a true miracle. No one in the history of Kung Fu was able to summon and control elements like that. It was the first in the history of animal kind. Not to mention Tai Lung's brilliant command over his soldiers the way he boosts their morale and most impressively the way he set up the position of his soldiers in the valley. It was breathtaking. It was something that would take a fellow general to truly appreciate. We need to retreat for now and launch an attack after we recovered mentally. Otherwise, we are just pigs waiting to be slaughtered. Master Sloth said and was about to announce an official order to retreat to his fleeing soldiers. But he was stopped. There will be no need. He is almost ready. A commander from the Kingdom of Nanzao said, objecting to Master Sloth's decision. Master Sloth bit his lips. Whether if they were his soldiers or not, he never liked seeing people die. But he knew he could not do anything else. It's all or nothing. Then we need to start moving. We save as many soldiers as possible. Go Master Sloth ordered, and the different masters which were in the middle of the army, shot out to fight in the front lines. These masters were shortly stopped by Master Ox and Master Croc, before they could change the tide of battle though. Hey, where are you going? Turtle Monk screamed at Master White Tiger who was slowly walking away from them. We were told to stay here until Master Eagle makes his move. I don't fucking care. White Tiger screamed and bared his fangs. His eyes were red in anger as he gazed towards Tai Lung. The Mothafaka had gotten this strong, huh? The image of the past where Tai Lung defeated him appeared in his mind, and it made him more agitated. All of his soldiers who were on the front lines and died were fresh in his mind. He was angry. Tai Lung is mine, he said and using a movement technique, he shot towards Tai Lung. The battle between two supreme felines. The strongest warrior and guardian of Dali versus the 11th power and the walking kingdom. White Tiger versus Tai Lung. Start. Tai Lung's POV I stood on of a small pile of bodies, which was on top of a small boulder as I looked down at the battlefield with a satisfied smile. My soldiers were winning as the enemy had given their back out of fear. It was not hard to cut down enemies who had no courage to face you. I had stopped fighting after taking out the initial soldiers as I needed to conserve Kai, especially after pulling off a big move like I just did. I did not know what the enemy was planning, so I had to be ready for everything. Besides, my effort would be better placed to change the tide of the war rather than to double down when we were already winning. The war continued on as the battle cry and the frequent explosion of cannons filled the valley. I was sure the ground was shaking too, although I was standing in an elevation so I couldn't feel it. I saw how they tried to send their Kung Fu masters to the front lines to change the tide of the battle, but just like I had instructed, Master Ox and Master Croc came down from the mountain and stopped them. They were Kung Fu masters, sure, but they were not even strong enough for me to remember their names. That meant each of them was weaker than one of the Furious Five, so even if there were eight of them, I knew Master Ox and Croc would be able to handle them. Push ahead my soldiers I roared from behind, giving more motivation and ferocity to my soldiers. And it also worked to frighten the enemy, as they were reminded of my despairing presence. It's like two children sparring in the presence of one parent. The kid without a parent would never even be able to muster enough aggression to give a proper fight. Everything was going well, until it was not. Vroom ahhhhhhh screams but this time, they drilled into my ears because they were from my soldiers. The wolves fighting at the front lines got their body thrown in the air, and before they hit the ground, their bodies were cut into multiple places as a whirlwind swept past them. The scene looked oddly similar to how I ran through the front lines not too long ago. If a master was to look at both scenes, they would be able to tell that both of them were executed in a shockingly similar manner. It was almost the exact same style of fighting and technique. Tai Lung, I heard an angry roar. I registered the wrath in the voice but I was stuck in its familiarity instead. A white blur, like the wind. I could feel how it flew right at me, destroying and knocking away anything between us as its aim stayed true. A heavy malicious intent grasped the air with its cold hands. Now my sense tickled, something deep in my bones which once guided my ancestor away from danger. It screamed, run or fight. A thin sound, sharp and high-pitched entered my sensitive ears, as I saw black claws slicing the air and coming at me. I pushed out my own claws and swiped up, slicing the space between us as two sets of claws met in a spark of razor clash. The place grew quiet before a shockwave erupted from us, blowing out waves of dust. My enemy stayed stagnant in the air, pushing himself up against my hand as I locked my arm by tightening my muscles. I was not going to move an inch. It's been a long time. By who? I said with an evil smirk as I looked at the tiger in front of me. Master White Tiger of Dali. 
You should have stayed in prison, he said in an icy cold voice, and then we moved. Our image blurred as we met in a continuous clash that the normal soldier could not even comprehend. We left a crater of destruction, and many things were cut or sliced apart as we fought in different places. The continuous spark created when our claws would meet was proof of our clash. It was also like fireworks as we danced around the battlefield, and slowly moved away from the main army. He was extremely fast. He was probably as fast as I was before being imprisoned by Ugwe. In the end, after our 211th clash, we separated from each other, and came to a slight agreement for a break. We both landed away from one another. A good 20 meters of distance was between us, and we faced each other. Nice to meet you too. I said with a small chuckle as I blew on my right claw which was glowing bright red due to the heat caused by the friction of our clash. Instead of greeting me back, he crossed his arms, and with a condescending look, he said, You have not made any improvement. Those were big words coming from a warm at Tai Lung. But it's still enough to put you in your place, no? I asked. We were talking about the Dragon Claw technique, which was a style of Kung Fu we both practiced. It was also one of my main fighting styles besides my Leopard Kung Fu. Long ago, we used to be rivals as fellow practitioners of the Dragon Claw Kung Fu. But after a short amount of time, it became obvious who was the once in a million genius as I left him in the dust. While he dedicated his life to that one specific Kung Fu, I went ahead of him and mastered every Kung Fu. I wouldn't be so sure, he said with a disdainful smile before crouching down. I immediately recognized his posture and a small smile tugged my lips while I crouched down too. It was a traditional challenge from one dragon cowl practitioner to another. It was almost like a cowboy gun duel. One attack will decide the winner. Give me your best, I said softly and mockingly. As an old rival, I decided to give him a chance and humor him. We exploded out from our position. The earth caved in under our strength as we shot at each other like the wildest tempest. I limited myself to not using Kai, as I utilized only the Dragon Clue technique. We cut through everything which resisted our approach towards each other. The wind became blades in the wake of our cash, as gnawing slash marks appeared everywhere. The ten claws in our hands turned into swords as we split apart every matter that stood away, including each other. It was so fast that there was no sound until we both appeared in each other places. I stood at the place he once at and he did the same. We waited. Then reality finally caught up with us, and a loud booming cry split the earth and sky. Boom a deep silence followed the most violent exchange of the war. It was the calm after the storm. Master White Tiger was the first to stand up, and there were multiple small cuts on his body. Small streams of blood painted his white fur crimson, but there were no serious injuries. I was still crouching down. Not because I did not want to, but because I couldn't. You've changed, I said in an eerie monotonous tone. Then small cuts also appeared on my body, painting my fur red. But unlike him, there was also a deeper wound right at my left chest. But that was not the only part where the difference between us ended. If you look closely, my wounds were bleeding more and there were small dark blood vessels popping out around them, especially on the huge claw mark on my chest. It was poison. Now I knew why my instincts were screaming at me that much when I could beat him easily. It explained why I felt a sense of threat even though I was stronger. He coated his claws with poison. Really? How could he? That posture, that challenge. It was meant to be respected with dignity. He had dedicated his whole life to this kung fu. It was baffling how he could show such disrespect, when even I, myself showed him courtesy by accepting his challenge. You lost your honor. Like I said before, you should have stayed in prison. He said and looked at me, now please die, Tai Lung. Tai Lung's POV I am strongest. That was no illusion, nor was it an exaggeration. But was I invincible? Was I undefeatable? Seeing myself completely paralyzed and poisoned through underhanded means by the enemy I respected more than hate, the answer to that question slowly appeared in my mind. Now please die, Tai Lung. His words echoed in the inner cavity of my ears. My body which was completely still and paralyzed, gave weight to his words. They felt like hammers. Yes. A pebble should not tell a mountain to move. I said with a smile as I pulled at my blue kai which was at the innermost part of my being. It was something I said to Shifu a few days ago, chapter 66. You can't only have destruction, sometimes you also need to heal and give life. During the week I spent training in the Jade Palace. I did more than just train my usage of Kai to cause massive destruction. I also learned how to use Kai to heal myself and others, because the last thing I wanted was to have to watch the people I care about die in my hands, or be killed by a petty poison. I let my blue Kai which was more responsive to healing techniques than my white Kai, flow through my body, and heal the damage the poison had done to me. I did not know how the healing techniques worked as that was something most stories never delve into in my past life. 
But I just imagine my cells working faster and giving birth to new cells, and strengthening my immune system to fight against the poison. The fact that I didn't have much clue about how healing works did not matter, as I used a massive amount of Kai to make up for it. My body started releasing steam as my temperature rose sharply. My wounds started disappearing at a visible speed. I regained the ability to move my body again, as I slowly stood up and cracked my neck. I could feel the astonished gaze of Master White Tiger on my back. Hum. I wondered out loud as I felt something come up from my throat. Spat I spat out a thick dark liquid which smelt like blood, but also something else. Hey 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 ha ha ha. I started laughing and turned to face Master White Tiger. The reason I accepted his challenge and humored him was that I was strong. I knew whatever trick he could pull up from his sleeves, it mattered not to me. I was too strong now and Kai was too versatile. In a way, I was happy that he did such things to me. The allied kingdoms were dishonorable as they kept the invasion a secret as long as they could. They did not declare a battle against us, nor did they announce their alliance. They have broken the codes of war. They have broken their honor. But I held the kings responsible for that, and thought at least the warriors and master were different, simply following the order of their king. But now I knew they were not honorable either. So, why hold back? Whoosh, I used flash steps to reach him at a speed he had never witnessed before. It was too fast that his mind didn't even have time to register if it was real or an imagination. You have eyes, but you do not see Mount Tai, I said when I was in front of him. A joke. That was the last words I offered him before I plunged my hand through his chest, effectively destroying his heart. His body froze, without a heartbeat. His eyes shook and widened to the limit as he locked his gaze with mine. Then everything turned bright blue in his vision as I used fire bending and burned his body. In a matter of seconds, his body turned into ash and was carried away by the winds of the battle. He would not even have a proper grave by which his loved ones could remember him. The Champion of Dali the guardian of the great city master white tiger. He died just like that, his death unhonored. Because that was how he lived, I shifted in my position and turned towards the battlefield again. My soldiers were still winning as only a few hours had passed. The valley made it so that the soldiers engaging in combat were always the same, and the only difference was that the enemy had plenty of replacements for the dead, so they had nigh unlimited stamina. So, although we were winning right now, I knew we would lose in a drawn-out battle. I needed to do something about that. I told him the consequences of doing such things would be heavy. I heard a voice from behind me, and I turned to look at the person who was able to nearly sneak up on me. The Turtle Monk. He was the eternal Kung Fu master of Tang whose age was unknown. He was a monk who rarely got into conflict through the years, and was said to be a relative of Ugwe himself. But unlike Ugwe who was old and wrinkly, the turtle monk was an extremely big and muscular guy with wide shoulders and huge arms. He was also grey in color, and he wore a big green necklace. But I am surprised you were able to shrug off the poison I made so easily. You have come further in mastering Kai than I could have ever expected, he said in a calm voice, but rather than his words. I was more focused on what he was doing. He was waving his hand around in the air as if he were catching something even though there was nothing there. But if you looked closely, you could tell that he was using a slight wind manipulation, and he was grabbing tiny ashes in the air, and putting them inside his wine bottle. It was the remaining ashes of White Tiger. My blue flames never leave ashes and completely burned any fuel. But it seemed I missed some. I wouldn't do that if I was you. I told him in a flat tone, yet it promised something if not followed, something not too pretty. I had bestowed White Tiger the punishment of not even having a proper grave. He would not defy me. Why not? He asked me and continued catching ashes in the air, before putting them inside his bottle. Why must one act dictate the value of a life lived? He was just doing what he should, trying his best for the people. I scoffed. Tell that to Ugwe in the spirit realm. Now I won't ask again. I said and turned my body towards him, readying myself to take action. He stopped. Right. He said and ceased his action of catching the ashes. He tucked his bottle at the side of his belt, and he breathed loudly and slowly, as I looked at the old turtle. I felt no malicious intent for him, forget about seeing me as an enemy. He didn't even see me as an opponent. And he was also extremely calm around me. He did not fear me. He did not fear the worst thing I could give him. He did not fear death. How odd. I had come across very few who did not fear death. He was one of them. I wouldn't focus on fighting an old turtle if I was you. He said suddenly, right before I was going to lunge at him. Wote, I believe you have more pressing matters. What do you mean? I asked. He stayed silent for a while. He's here. The fuck? Who is? 
What do yo dash my words evaporated in my throat as I snapped my head to look behind me. I did not even pay heed to the turtle monk who sneaked away and went into hiding after that, because there was something gravely wrong about reality. I looked at the direction of the opposing army, and I looked further behind them and into the endless expanse of the horizon. I did not even have time to doubt as that feeling grew bigger and bigger in my chest. It started in my heart. Then my stomach until my whole body was filled with a deep sense of unease. Instincts I had honed for years and some I did not even know about started crying out, screaming at me. This was different from when I first engaged with White Tiger. This was something much worse. What is this? I asked myself when I felt the unfamiliar emotion in my chest. Then I finally realized that something was approaching the battlefield. It was fast, too fast that I could not see it, nor sense it with my kai. What was it? I wondered. It couldn't have been artificial. Was it a meteorite? There was no sound. There was no object. And there was no telling as it moved at a speed far incomprehensible to me. It felt like I was trying to sense light itself with how fast it was moving. But then, in a split second, everything changed again. I felt intention. I felt bloodlust. The thing was an animal, no. An enemy. Everyone run. I managed to scream out to my soldiers. But then it reached us. It was impossibly fast, its speed seemed to ridicule the very law of space itself. I was not sure what happened next because there was no sound and I couldn't see it. The world cried out in despair, and the most violent shockwave and tornado descended on the earth. Mountains were cleaved. Then I finally found out what the feeling in my chest was. It has been so long since I felt that emotion so I had nearly forgotten it. Fear. Uuuuum third POV what's the fastest animal in the modern world? The obvious answer which popped into the average mind might be a gazelle or a cheetah. But those are not the correct answer. The fastest animal in the world was a bird. The peregrine falcon. That was the name of the fastest animal in the world. It could easily reach up to the speed of 390 kilometers per hour. Around four times faster than that of a cheetah. How does a simple bird reach such frightening speed? The answer lies in the body and the technique that the peregrine falcon possessed. It would fly up high in the sky before it tucked its wings and dived down like a missile. Its body was streamlined and perfectly designed to cut through the air with ease. Its powerful wings propel it faster and faster as it plunges towards the earth. Its feathers were stiff to reduce drag, and the bird used gravity to its favor to get the ferocious speed that it was known for. The bird used this technique to hunt its prey which consists mostly of ducks and pigeons. Diving down at such speed, its prey would get their head chopped off even before they realized they were being hunted by the fastest animal in the world. Now, in this world of Kung Fu and Kai, there was one person who used the same technique as the fastest animal in the modern world. His name was feared throughout China, and his strength was such that even his own king would never dare order him. Mighty Eagle. To not be mistaken, the renowned Eagle merely utilized the same technique as the Peregrine Falcon. The caliber at which they used the same concept was vastly different. I think I'd better make a move. Mighty Eagle said with a light-hearted chuckle as he looked down at the battlefield from the mesosphere. His eagle eyes were able to cover the distance of 80 kilometers with ease and watch the battlefield as if he was right above it. After his chuckle died down at the height which most birds had never reached, he started his dive. For reference, a normal bird in the modern world rarely flies higher than the troposphere which ends at 10 kilometers. But Mighty Eagle was easily staying in the mesosphere 80 plus kilometers high up the sky. At such insane height, Mighty Eagle began his descent. His powerful wings, a thousand times stronger than the peregrine falcons, flapped multiple times to propel him towards the earth. His body, streamlined and coated with the thinnest layer of kai, made it so that his body felt like it was cutting through empty space. He encounters no drag or resistance in the atmosphere. In just a few seconds, his huge body turned into a blur, and he left sound behind. A huge explosion which signifies the breaking of the sound barrier was the last sound the attack made. For the rest of the descent, sound tried effortlessly to catch up to Mighty Eagle. His body did not slow down, and his speed did not remain constant. The closer he get to the ground the faster he got until the world even failed to register his existence. Kai, which was basically the world itself, had no time to interact with him. It makes him flicker out of reality as his body becomes impossible to sense. For all reality cared, Mighty Eagle no longer existed. When Mighty Eagle was about to reach the ground, he spread out his wings ever so slightly. His wingspan became a deadly blade slicing at a speed incomprehensible to the world. There was no sound, there was no sight, there was no telling. Everything happened, but nothing noticed it. Mighty Eagle flew straight through the valley at that godly speed. But as stated, nothing notices it. So there was no visible effect until the action had long been executed. But when reality finally noticed it and the world catches up, all hell broke loose. Chaos descended upon the world. Boo you? 
Mountains were cleaved, and bodies were dismantled. Nothing was spared from the destruction that Mighty Eagle had brought down upon the world. But no one heard the explosion and chaos. Because by the time those things caught up, everyone who was meant to be dead was dead. The attack had no name. Because how can you name something which you can neither see nor hear? Even the ones who were lucky enough to survive it did not know what happened, and simply thought they had lost their memory of what happened. It was done. Mighty Eagle had proven one of the tiles he was known by, the Vanquisher of Armies. And so, Uguay wrote in one of his scrolls and Tai Lung read, a new type of Kung Fu that I have never seen before, and one that could not be replicated. It carries no sound nor image for it to be named. It defies the fundamental laws of this universe, and thus could not be explained. And so, Mighty Eagle was able to cut down mountains with a flap of his wings, forever carving his name in history as one of the strongest Kung Masters that had ever graced China. Tai Lung's POV. What just happened? I said in the desolate silence of the valley. Just a few seconds ago, the valley was filled with the vigorous screams of warriors battling each other, and the sound of iron clashing with iron. Now it was the ghost of a moment ago. I checked my body carefully and I was completely unharmed. Although I might not be able to see or realize what was going on, my body driven by instincts was able to save itself from any harm. But everyone else, not so much. I waved my hand and used my kite to bend the air. A small whirlwind erupted and cleared the dust and smoke-filled valley, revealing the damage of the aftermath. There was no longer a valley. The mountains had been cleaved, and the uneven land had been turned into a plain. The crumbled mountains buried in its depth the gorillas and their cannons. The chance of survival was slim, and even if they were alive, their scream would be unheard through all the layers of earth. I tapped my ear as it rang loudly. I tried to listen for any survivors, but to no avail. The constant ringing had blocked everything out. So I walked on the broken battlefield and observed carefully. The earth was mixed with the blood of soldiers friend and foe, and their mingled corpses which were splattered around like dead leaves, were not a sight I was very fond of. Whatever it was that hit us, it did not differentiate friend or foe, as I saw the equal corpses of my army and the enemy. Luckily, there were still some who survived, but they were knocked unconscious due to shock. I continued walking, and when I reached the place where the battle was taking place, it was filled with mountains of corpses which was buried in a mound of earth. They looked like potatoes ready to be harvested. But then my eye caught something, and I stopped, and stilled. Alpha, I looked at the bisected corpse of my commander, and he was also holding his weapon tight in his hands even as his body was completely severed. The last talk we had not too long ago came to my mind. His stupid smile as he talked a big talk, his eyes that held absolute faith in me, as he entrusted his fate into my hands. His wife who was waiting for him back in the city, the one who had refused to leave because she said he would protect her in the city. I wonder how I will react when I see her face. It was strange, how someone so alive could end up so dead in the next moment. Now his body was mixed with the earth, and he would forever lay cold, embraced by the world who had once given him warmth and life. But why am I saying all this? Why am I feeling these emotions again? This is war. I was not naive. I realized that people die in wars. I have fought enough battles, and seen enough violence that I have already been through the initial shock of war, and what it truly meant. I was already above all of it. I had accepted the fact that the moment you call yourself a warrior, you have decided to walk with death and are ready to give up your life at any moment. That was why I never really held a regard for a warrior or a soldier's life, as long as they are not great kung fu masters or something close. I might come across as evil to some people because of such outlook I had. But that was the belief you must hold in this world. Or else you would worry tirelessly and get hurt with every death in this accursed world. Yet, in rare moments like these I allowed myself to grieve for a life lost. I wonder why I was feeling this now. It was not like I knew Alpha personally. I have been closer to people and I did not react when they die in battle. I see. It was not that I was grieving for Alpha because I was close to him. It was because I did not want him to die, and I thought I had enough power to not let him die. So I built an emotional connection with him. But he did. He died even before I knew it. I was as helpless as any civilian when it happened. The strongest in the world. How hallow must that title be if it did not allow me to achieve what I desire. Instead it only brought destruction to the people around me. I became angry. I became enraged. I seethe. I tore my eyes off my commander's corpse and looked up to the sky. My eyes locked on the giant eagle who was flying above. It did not take a genius to figure out that mighty eagle was the one who had caused this destruction. But how? My mind worked with the clarity of a pond even when I was seething. With all the knowledge I held and analyzing the events that just took place, it did not take me long to realize what happened and how he did it. I see. 
call his victorious screech filled the sky and pierced my already ringing ear. He flapped his wings causing a disturbance in the atmosphere as his gigantic body sailed through the air with the confidence of a king. Soliders. Regroup and launch an attack. I heard the yell of Master Sloth in the distance as I turned to look at them. The soldiers who were not inside the valley started regrouping and marched towards me. They were still shocked and affected by the calamity that just struck, but knowing that it was done by Mighty Eagle, and seeing my army, which seemed invincible before, lay down and dead, gave them enough motivation to approach me. They are defenseless let US Avenger fallen comrades. The God of the Sky is with US we cannot lose this war. They beat their drums, they beat their shield. The steps they took gained confidence as they gained distance. They started approaching me, and since there was no longer a valley to protect us, they came in all their might. 200,000 of them. They surrounded me. They were like dark clouds that came from the east and promised a destructive storm. It was done. The war had been concluded. They won the war. Is that what you think? I asked in a whisper which was unheard and drowned into silence with all the sound they made. My anger grew until it felt like it was going to suffocate me. I rage at their audacity and my Kai comes alive. It reacts to my anger and enhances it, like adding fuel to a burning fire. Then I released all of my wrath and my raging Kai to the outside world through a technique. My will bent the will of the world as it pressed down on reality, caving it and leaving a permanent mark. A wave of Kai and anger, indistinguishable in one, burst out like an explosion of energy and willpower. It shook the entire fallen valley and the clear sky quickly darkened as storm clouds made themselves known from above as if reflecting my anger. Boom. Conqueror's Haki it was a technique I had worked on since the beginning, due to its sheer versatility in battle. It was a technique that allowed one to face off against an army, without even having to lift a finger. I have achieved a similar technique by mixing killing intent and Kai, but it could never measure up to the real thing. But now I was finally able to replicate that technique. My willpower exploded out in a bubble of dark grey energy as it continued ravaging reality like a constant sonic explosion. My willpower pressed on the world and onto every soldier present. The lesser beings and the soldiers with weak willpower started dropping down like puppets, as they were deemed unworthy to be in my presence. The presence of a conqueror, a supreme king. In just a few seconds, almost all of the infantry fell unconscious with their eyes turning white and foam leaking out of their mouth. My willpower was something which simple mortals could not resist. I stopped after a few seconds as the decrease in my Kai was too alarming. But by that time, the world had fallen into a sullen silence again. It was like a child who dared not make a sound before his angry father. Ha! I breathed out sharply as I felt all my bubbling anger disappear. I also felt my will weaker than ever. If I had to explain it, the difference was like the will you had when you just woke up and the will you had right after being motivated by a speech. But I shook my head and gathered myself. Then my eyes looked up to the sky again. I met eyes with Mig the Eagle who was flying around me like a vulture. His face was serious and grave. Chicken was my favorite meat. It was due to this reason that when I first met the messenger or even Master Crane, I wondered if they would taste like chicken. It was a question that always plagued the furthest corner of my mind. Does the bird in this world taste like chicken? Or would they taste even better? Today? I will find out. Run. I mouthed to Mighty Eagle and he did. He flapped his mighty wings and took to the sky again. He was not exactly running away, but he was preparing to execute the same attack for a second time. While he was busy preparing for his trump attack, I turned my focus back on the battlefield. My soldiers who were still alive were slowly waking up. My conquered Haki did not simply knock the enemy unconscious, but it also worked to stir up my soldiers. We have not lost yet. Tai Lung's POV to see the fallen bodies of 200,000 soldiers was something I didn't know would be impressive. What a sight it was to behold. Their fallen bodies were so much that they hid the soil below, completely stopping me from seeing the earth. From a distance they looked more unreal than when they were up on their feet, shouting and marching. All soldiers, carry your fallen comrades and retreat back to the camp. I said but my Kai magnified my voice, making it so that every conscious mind heard it. My soldiers who were bewildered and confused at what was happening opted to follow my orders without question. They woke up their comrades beside them and carried the injured before they started their retreat. Now onto the enemy. I slammed my foot on the ground as hard as I could. A violent shockwave exploded out and shook the earth as many of the huge boulders the fragments of a mountain that once stood tall were tossed up to the air. Then I moved in quick succession. I used the boulders as a football and kicked them towards the enemy army. The huge boulders, easily weighing a ton each, sailed through the air. They were cold and heartless, they only knew to obey the force that kicked them. In their unconscious state, there was nothing they could do except get crushed mercilessly like a meat paste. I did not like what I was doing at all. It felt disrespectful to the soldiers brave enough to face Tai Lung. 
that they were killed while they were unconscious. I did not like taking advantage of their weakest and most helpless state. It was also against the codes of war to ambush the enemy while they slept, or to kill a completely defenseless enemy. But I shall spare no honor to those who were not honorable. Let the heavens know that I was not the first one to break the codes of war. Everyone protect the soldiers stop him. Master Sloth quickly directed the remaining soldiers' masters who were strong enough to withstand my will and anger to protect the helpless. They moved swiftly before breaking the boulders flying their way, quickly turned them into pebbles before it turned their soldiers into dead meat. Yet they could never fully stop my endless onslaught. Maybe they stopped a quarter of them before the boulders crushed their friends and comrades. I continued my action of sending huge boulders towards them, as they worked hard to defend. But they quickly realized it was futile, so they went for the alternative which was stopping me. They shot towards me at breakneck speed. They were fast in every standard except mine. Stop him. They screamed such funny words. I did not even bother to acknowledge or analyze them as I used flash steps to teleport in their eyes. Then I raised them like weeds, cutting them down one by one in a brutal show of slaughter. I did not hold back, so they broke faster than a twig. Soon, fresh blood painted my gray fur, as their last screams drowned out the constant ringing in my ear. The scream became lesser and lesser before it became almost silent. I blitzed towards the leopard kung fu master from Dali, and when I was in front of him, I pulled my arm back and launched a devastating punch that I intended to blow him apart with. But before my fist carrying the force of a cannon could hit him, a giant turtle monk suddenly pulled him away and switched places with him. I saw all of this, but I did not stop. Instead, I increased the power of my punch with a smirk on my face. Hair P.O.W. And then a flash of blue lightning that made reality crack like glass. Thunderclip. Car Chang an explosion, a shockwave that pushed everything back with a violent thrust. This usually works with other people. I commented while looking at my fist which was stopped in silence by his seemingly impenetrable armor. I'm sure it does. Turtle Monk replied with his deep and smooth voice. It reminded me of a black coffee. He also tapped at his underbelly, and the frontal armor of his shell resounded loudly to show its solidity. The rice cakes I had in the morning definitely felt that. Do they? Well, then let me ask them directly, I said, and in quick succession, I reeled back my arm and threw another punch. This time I used my full strength from the start, and I intended to break his shell and open up his stomach. Turtle Monk spun on his heel and turned his back at me. His back had thicker and sturdier shell of armor, but I was also putting more strength behind my attack. Can he tank it? My fist slammed on his shell, and his natural armor caved in due to the force. A huge dent appeared on his shell but it surprisingly held strong. Then a crackle of lighting erupted. Reality was like a body of water, and as I forcefully hit it, it made a giant splash that disrupted its serene state. Thunderclap. Turtle Monk grunted, and his heavy body got propelled away like a dummy. But he still completed his objective as he grabbed the leopard with both hands, and they both flew away from me. He withstood my attack. Impressive. I guess I have no choice but to hit him with internal destruction next time. I was sure his armor would crack like Master Croc did. But I guess there were levels even when it came to renowned impenetrable defenses. And with that, my time of peace was gone. I felt an eerie foreboding in the air. It was like the world was crying out for help to all who could hear her. It did not like being crossed. It did not like housing speed and might which it was not made for. I laughed and I used flashbacks to get out of the valley quickly. I felt a piercing gaze on my back, and that reassured me to move even faster. I crossed mountains and hills before I stopped when I was far enough, so that my soldiers would not be affected by Mighty Eagle's attack. From the initial attack, I knew the collateral damage this could cause. The place I found myself was filled with mutanes and hills. It was a thick forest and full of trees for me to hide and take cover behind. The enemy continued to gaze at me, at my bold challenge to face him one-on-one. -on -one. He could have gone and finished off my army, but he didn't. Because their main aim was never about defeating the army or taking over the city. It was always about killing me. Come and try, I taunted. Then as if to reply to my challenge, he began his descent from the mesosphere. I could still sense him as he dived down towards the earth, towards my direction. His speed became rapidly faster as I pushed my palms against each other and prepared for the technique to counterattack. My mean sense was stuck on my enemy as he went supersonic. But soon enough, in a few seconds, he became too fast to even sense. He completely disappeared from existence. He will reach my position any moment now. His technique, while as impressive as it was, had quite a few flaws you could point out even just by seeing it once. The first thing was that just like how I could not sense him, 
He also could not sense the world around him when he was diving down at such speed. That was one of the reasons why he spent so long preparing for the technique, as he had to calculate where he was going before he even start his descent. I got proof of this when he waited until I stayed in one place before he dived down. If he could control himself at such speed, he would dive down and simply follow me as I was moving away from the battlefield. That meant as long as the target was moving around, his attacking strategy was completely useless. It's most likely why he only used it for huge armies, as those were not moving as quickly as an individual master would. Also, it wouldn't make sense for him to be able to change his trajectory mid-flight, when he was moving too fast to the point of confusing reality. He was completely blind like us when he attacked. The second thing I found out was that Mighty Eagle and the Monkey King were equals. It was why the Kingdom of Nanazhao and Shu were always at a standstill with no clear winners. But how, how could Monkey King contend with Mighty Eagle who had a trump card attack like this? He was weaker than me in every way you could measure, yet I was having trouble dealing with Mighty Eagle. The answer can only lie in Kung Fu or technique. It means that the Monkey King had a technique which completely counters Mighty Eagle, and made the clash between them a draw. The only question left was what that technique was it. I had to recall every moment I shared with Monkey King, and analyze everything carefully before I came to a satisfactory conclusion. The strange attack he used in our last meeting, the one where he pushed his palm forward and sent a shockwave that could carve out his handprint on the earth. I had easily dodged it back then, and when Monkey King realized it was ineffective, he did not use that technique again. But at this moment, it was the only technique I remembered Monkey King using which was a possible counter to Mick the Eagle's attack. So I gathered my Kai and my palm and compressed it into a small space. I replayed the scene of the Monkey King using the same technique in my mind and replicated it. Mighty Eagle had completely disappeared from existence without a trace. But calculating from the last place I sensed him, I was able to tell from which direction he would be coming from. And then when my instincts came alive and screamed at me to move away from death, I pushed my palm out and launched my attack. It was exactly like the Buddha's palm attack I knew from my other life. A relentless shock would rushed out from my palm, and they pushed away everything in their path. The force was strong enough to uproot the trees and peel the topmost layer of the soil completely. Mighty Eagle who was moving at incomprehensible speed was forced to an abrupt halt by the force. The air between us was compressed to the point that it was trembling violently, and it was visible to the eyes. Ah, Mig the Eagle roared out in frustration and pain as his body was forced to remain stagnant. My attack and his missile body met in an epic clash that shook the mountains and reshaped the earth. A wave of force was sent out on the earth as if it was an ocean, and when the earth finally realized it was supposed to be solid, it opened up and cried in despair. Impossible destruction was left in the wake of our clash. But ultimately, maybe it was because I was not used to the technique yet. But I lost the clash. Mighty Eagle was able to push through the force, and his body cut through the air at a much slower, yet equally frightening speed. I leapt to the side as Mig the Eagle's body cut through everything like a hot razor through butter. All of the trees in the forest were cut apart by his sharp wings, and they were tossed to the sky. The tops of hills and mountains got the same fate. Everything happened fast, but the speed was something I could keep up with. After only a quarter of a second, Mighty Eagle emerged in the sky behind me. He came out victorious on our second clash, and I came out with a scratch. ECH? I clicked my tongue as a gnashing cut appeared from my shoulder across my chest. Blood spurt out like a waterfall before I controlled my muscles to quickly seal the wound. Whatever. Now I knew how to deal with him. I used flash steps and shot up to the sky and towards Mighty Eagle. I hope he remembered that he was not the only one who could fly. Tai Lung's POV I used flash steps and shot up to the sky and towards Mighty Eagle. I hope he remembered that he was not the only one who could fly. While I shoot across the sky I used the countless trees and small boulders which were cut and tossed to the air due to the shockwave as a stepping stone. I pushed myself off these objects in such a way that I also sent them flying back towards the valley, where they would crash at the enemy soldiers. I did this while I continued to pursue Mighty Eagle who was gathering himself from his attack. I knew such a devastating attack would take a toll on his body. His senses must be messed up, and I am pretty sure his brain was rattled too. In fact, I was quite impressed with how he was able to shrug off the after effects so easily the first time. After kicking a few more trees towards the enemy army, I finally managed to clash with him as he was flying in the sky. I cut off his flight path, and I delivered a thunderclap punch. But without a proper foothold, I was not able to muster even a quarter of my true strength. It should be remembered that the strength of each attack mostly comes from the legs first, so my power was reduced considerably while in the air. My fist slammed against the side of his body as he covered himself with his wings. Upon contact, it felt like his feathers were made of sleek steel, 
and my fist slipped away without landing a proper hit. Boom, you dare. He spat out, you dare challenge me on my own turf. I am the king of the sky. I would have laughed at his ridiculously cringe declaration if I was not aware of the destruction he could cause. In all honesty, I find no better warrior to claim such title. Then we separated only to clash again a few moments later. Thus, the battle continued in the sky and believe it or not, we were fighting on equal level. I utilized flash steps to use the atmosphere as a foothold, and I streaked across the sky in zigzags. By using flash steps, I was able to increase the force behind my attacks by a huge margin, and I also used my air bending to make myself less predictable by changing trajectories. Mighty Eagle was born to thrive in the sky so naturally. He was the one having the upper hand. One flap of his powerful wings was enough to cause hurricanes, and with one swing, he was able to propel himself with the force of a missile. He used his sharp wings to try and slice me apart, and he also used them as heavy shields to protect himself from my attacks. A figure blurred in the sky, and explosions would erupt in the clear sky like thunder as we met again and again in different clashes. My body streaked across the air, and his body spun and danced through the air like a kite. We continued our exchange until the results were undeniable. I could not best the creature who was born to rule the sky on his own turf. It was just impossible. Maybe I would have a better chance after I mastered airbending, but as I am now, I have no chance against him. It was a waste of Kai and energy. I took in a sharp breath and used the sun breathing. Then I activated my fire bending, which caused fire to erupt from the surface of my back as I shoot towards Mighty Eagle like a rocket. My arm soon caught on fire as well and I launched at him. His eyes narrowed, and as you would expect from a bird that could obtain such speed, his reaction was insanely fast. He quickly tucked his wings and spun around to create a small vortex around him. My fire punch died in the air, as the rapid displacement of air oxygen caused them to lose their intensity and direction. Then he suddenly spread his wings, making a small shockwave that was able to knock me off my balance for only a fraction of a second. My body fell from the sky, but that was all Mighty Eagle needed. His sharp talons, which were designed by nature to never let go of what it got hold of, wrapped themselves around me. They quickly closed like a bear trap, and his sharp talons easily sank into my flesh and bones. I growled for the first time in two decades, in absolute agony. With his talons grabbing me tight, he started spinning around like crazy, and he dived towards the earth to get a burst of speed. He was trying to throw me off balance and make me dizzy. He succeeded. I was completely helpless as he flapped his wings and flew up to the sky again. I grabbed his talons and tried to pull his claws off of my body but they stayed firm. I opened my jaw and bite down on his talon. He screeched in pain but still won't let go. We both struggled together in the air as he flew me back towards the battlefield, where I noticed the unconscious soldiers had already woken up during a fight in the sky. In the end, an idea pooped in my mind. I stopped biting down on his talons and opened my mouth instead. Then I took in a deep breath and used the sun breathing to the full limit. I took in a huge gust of air, and as the air filled my lungs, I shaped my kite to accomplish my desire. My lungs felt full and extremely hot as an orange light started coming from the back of my throat. I felt the inside of my esophagus and mouth burn due to the heat. This was my first time doing such a feat, so I was making a lot of mistakes. But then a line of fire bursts out of my mouth like a dragon. The flames were blue and bright orange as it hit Mighty Eagle point blank. Not even a second later, I felt his claws throw me violently from the sky. His curved talons came out of my body as I fell down from the sky and crashed to the broken valley. But this time, I was in the middle of the enemy army. I coughed a few times and I felt my damaged throat. Then I used my Kai to quickly heal up my wounds and they did. But at the cost of a huge chunk of Kai, maybe fighting him in the sky was not such a wise decision. But then again, it was either that or I let him recover and pull out his special dive attack again. At least I inflicted some fatal wounds on him as well. His feathers and underbelly were burned which would greatly hinder his flying ability, and his talons were now injured. I pulled myself up on my feet as the soldiers slowly surrounded me. They were cautious as they did not want what happened to repeat again. The feelings of my anger and willpower were also still fresh in their mind. No need to be scared. I said and dusted myself off. My body had healed completely at least from the outside. Come at me. They did. Attack from all directions, they rushed towards me, thousands of them. It was like the repeat of my battle in the Chengdu Plains where I fought and won against the impossible number of 50,000 soldiers. But this time, I was fighting against around four times that number. Plus, I was also tired from fighting against Mighty Eagle. He was definitely one of the most annoying opponents I had faced as he was very tricky and knew exactly how to take advantage of his position. He knew he was weaker than me, so he was extremely careful. And he fought me with only his strong points. 
hiding his position for as long as he could, waiting for me to make a big move and ambush me. Just when I thought we were winning and let my guard down, keeping me in the dark about his ability, forcing me into situations where I had no choice but to react a certain way. He was not only strong but cunning. I wonder if it was all his plan or was it by someone else. As I was thinking such thoughts, the battle started again as I stood against thousands of warriors and fought against them alone. I moved across the battlefield like a well oiled machine, as I took the lives of ordinary soldiers like a harvester. Their main goal was to tire me out, while Mighty Eagle and others recovered, so that the big shots would be able to take me down when they are ready, and I tire out. As if I was going to play by their rules, I leapt up and used the heads of the soldiers as a footholds. I broke their necks and cracked their skulls as I ran along the endless rows of heads. My senses guided me to the place that I wanted as I blitzed across the battlefield. Then I finally locked eyes with the one I was running towards. Tai Lung dashed the turtle monk who was nursing his cracked shell, looked at me in shock when I used flash steps to appear in front of him instantly. Say hi to Ugwe for me. I said and I landed a roundhouse kick at his frontal shell. But unlike before, this one would kill the turtle who had lived for who knows how long. Armament Haki, internal destruction. The force went past all the thick layers of armor he had, and only attacked his soft organs. The inside of a body could never be trained. He stayed rooted in his spot, and his body trembled before blood flowed out of his eyes, ears and nose. He was a giant turtle with thick muscles that were hard like steel. But all were for naught as he fell limp on the ground. I disappeared from the place and I ran through the soldiers again. Their bodies were sent flying with cuts on their tendons or blood vessels. The lucky ones only got their bones broken. Protect the general, protect Master Sloth. In a shocking display of rare competence, the commanders yelled out the order when they saw me killing the turtle monk. They crowded around Master Sloth, so I find myself having difficulty cutting through their ranks. Although they might be weak individually, they made up for it in sheer numbers. I kicked one of the soldiers in the abdomen and sent his body up to the sky. Before I also leapt to the sky, you would have thought I would learn from my mistakes and not challenge Mighty Eagle in the sky again. But that's wrong. I will. Fighting now was a better alternative than trying again after being exhausted. If I take down all of these big players, then the war will be as certain as already being won. Besides that, I sense my own soldiers attacking from the front as they tried to tunnel towards the middle, so that they could save me. How nice of them to do so when they were already so small. When he saw me flying up to the sky again, Mighty Eagle released a shrilling screech that pierced the sky. Then he dived towards me with his talons opening wide to grab a hold of me again. I was slower and way more limited in the sky compared to Mighty Eagle. So it was inevitable that he would eventually get a hold of me again like he did before. So I needed to finish this quickly. I closed my eyes and felt the Kai inside of me. I was running out of Kai, and I only possessed a quarter of my total reserves right now. The amount of healing I did coupled with my unrefined fire bending in Conqueror's Haki had drained me. But nevertheless, I focused on the task at hand. I gathered my Kai at the palm of my hand, but unlike when I copied the palm attack from Monkey King, I pulled out the pure energy of Kai outside my palm. Then I controlled that energy to form a ball, and let it rotate rapidly on top of my palm. It required impeccable control and focus, so that the ball of universal energy would not explode. Rasengan, Tai Lung's POV a small vortex formed on my palm. Due to the effect of the Rasengan, I propelled myself up higher and higher into the air. A bright glowing blue ball of pure Kai was rotating at blinding speed on my palm. It took a great effort and concentration to maintain the Rasengan, but it must have given off many red flags and threats, because Mighty Eagle flapped his wings to a stop. He stayed in his place for a few seconds before he turned back to fly away. Or, come back here. I roared. I used flash steps and shoot towards him while maintaining the Rasengan in my hand. He continued fleeing and flew high into the sky, trying to do his dive attack again. But I would not allow such things. As I said, my soldiers were already up and fighting again, so they could be victims. And also, I was not very excited to face that again, even though I think I would be able to stop it the third time. I flew as fast as I could propelling myself by turning the air into a foothold through flash steps. Maybe I had surpassed my limits in a moment of intensity, but I was able to catch up to him miraculously. I got ready to slam my Rasengan against his body, but Mighty Eagle swiftly turned around to fly upside down, and then he flapped his wings as hard as he could while screeching. Shock waves and sound waves. It was not that I miraculously caught up to him, but he was baiting me. I felt my eardrums pop and my vestibular system which is the organ of balance was shaken. I lost balance in the sky, and I fell like a shot bird towards the ground. Mighty Eagle did not approach me, since I still had my Rasengan. Instead, he flew up to the sky at full speed. Rasengan took a lot of concentration and focus, 
That was why I said it before, that it was till not usable in real combat yet. My own words were proven true because otherwise, I would have never fallen for such a cheap bait. I crashed and landed on the ground, and my Rasengan also exploded. It shook the entire forest, and the whole place trembled as if a great earthquake had struck the place the ground beneath my palm, had a deep crater, which shows the amount of damage the Rasengan did. If I had managed to catch Mighty Eagle with that, the war would have been over instantly. Oh fucking hell. I cursed out while I staggered up to my feet. I felt disoriented and I nearly fell down again. I closed my eyes and focused on regaining my sense of balance, which was not that difficult with all my years of training. But in the end, I had let Mighty Eagle escape me, and now he was preparing for that devastating attack again. My mind worked over time as I tried to think up a solution. In the end, I made up a quick plan before it got too late. I purposely threw myself on the ground and pretended that I was falling off balance. I appeared more affected by the sound waves than I really was as I crawled around. I knew Mighty Eagle was observing me. His eagle eyes were always felt on my back and I needed to make sure he attacked me, instead of my remaining soldiers in the valley. I staggered exaggeratedly up to my feet and shook my head as if trying to regain clarity. And, just like I had hoped, I felt Mighty Eagle's focus remain too stuck on me. Come on, it's a great chance to kill me. It was bait, the same thing he had done just now. And he took it. I felt Mighty Eagle reach the necessary height for his attack. Then he started his descent and dived towards me. By that time, I remained rooted in one spot and got into a new stance I hadn't used in any of my fights. Now how do I stop him? The last clash showed that I did not have the necessary mastery over the palm attack to match him like Monkey King did. Should I hope for the best and use the same attack again? Or should I try something new and finally reveal the greatest offensive attack I had recreated since I mastered Kai? I picked the latter. I closed my eyes and put my hands together at the side of my body tucking them close to my ribs. I focused on the Kai inside of my body and summoned all of them. I was running low on Kai, and if I used any less, I am afraid this attack might not work. This was all or nothing. Kai, the fuel of miracles. I have found out that it works better when you have a clear visualization, belief and intent into what you are trying to achieve. That way, you would need less amount of Kai to achieve the same feat, and it can also make it more potent. Well, I have the right attack which satisfy all these factors for me. I felt Mighty Eagle dive towards my direction, and he broke the sound barrier. Then I also started my attack, came from my right hand, my white Kai was flowing out, and from my left hand, a blue Kai was materializing. These two Kai became one as they merged and built up to a more potent attack. His presence disappeared from my senses as he entered ghost speed. From the other two times I had experienced this attack, I knew how long it would take to reach me after he disappeared from my senses like this. Haim I continued focusing on my technique as I put everything I had into this iconic attack. I had enough intention and desire. I had an overwhelming surplus of visualization, because ever since I was young, I dreamed of doing this, and I also had the concept behind this attack plus the Kai. The air stilled and reality choked. I did not see it. I did not hear it. But I knew it was here. The world seemed to be cut into two. But it haven't realized it yet. It was now. Ha! Huh. I pushed my palm forward and released the energy in a powerful beam of wave that flood out like a road. The color was silver, and it rushed towards the enemy who was approaching at incomprehensible speed. Boom, the earth was ripped apart. It was scorched and every place the beam went, it peeled off and disintegrated. The trees were uprooted, and the mountains that stood tall and proud in the distance were easily pierced through as they crumbled like a castle built upon sand. Everything happened so fast. There was an odd silence, a dramatic pause after the intense chaos as I fell down on one knee. But it was because of Kai exhaustion and not an injury. I looked behind me, and I released a smile when I saw the mountain which was perfectly cleaved in an angle. It seemed I had shot Mighty Eagle at one side of his wing, so he swerved and his sharp wings moving at a speed of who knows what barely missed me. I looked at the sky, and my eyes stayed on the falling body of Mighty Eagle. I remained kneeling down as I watched him crash at the side of one mountain. That was it. I won. It took me more than I was comfortable with, but I won. Tylon's POV. I took a few moments to collect myself and bask in the feeling of a hard-fought battle won. Then I started moving towards the mountain behind me where Mighty Eagle had crash-landed. I did not use any special techniques and ran on all four. I ran up the mountain and swiftly maneuvered through the vegetation before I reached the place in slightly over a minute. There, I found a wide crater which cradled the warrior of Nanza. His breath was heavy, and his blood was slowly flowing down the slopes of the mountain. He would not die from this, but it was a fatal injury. 
He did not even notice me as I walked up to him. I saw that my Kai had pierced through his shoulder and left a gaping hole from which blood seeped out. Look at you, I said, not so mighty now. I grabbed his body and pulled him out from the ground, and I threw him. He rolled on his back as his breath became more haggard due to fear. Should I kill him? The thought definitely crossed my mind. But in the end, I rejected the idea because it would be a waste to kill such a brilliant kung fu master. But that didn't mean I forgave him for killing my soldiers or for attempting to kill me. The consequences would befall him. Try not to die. I said and pressed my foot on his chest. Then I grabbed his mighty wing. My claws sank into his flesh, and I tugged at it violently. No no Nuo in a moment of despair and fear, he let out a shrill of protest and begged me. But I replied by twitching my muscles and giving a heavy pull. The brutal sound of flesh tearing and joints pooping out was heard as I pulled out his wing. H H H H. His voice, which once echoed through the sky in a screech of victory and intimidation, turned into a scream of pure agony. It sounded helpless and broken. His blood spurted out like a fountain and painted my fur red. I had a sick smile on my face before I switched to his other side. I pressed my feet down on his chest as he struggled violently like a dying animal, trying to escape but he couldn't. Please, 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 no please. His voice rang out like a broken music player. Flying was everything to him. It was an act of absolute freedom to him. It was his greatest strength that had earned him all of his fame and prestige. So as I stripped him of this privilege, he turned into a sobbing child who wouldn't stop begging. It was your choice. Every action has a consequence. I said and pulled at his wing again. This time, due to the injury on his shoulder, his wing tore off easily. He let out a shilling scream, and it echoed through the forest like thunder. For someone who first appeared in silence. He sure made a lot of noise by the end. I grabbed him by his throat. His face was ruined with tears and snot. His eyes were hollow, and there was no longer light in them, although he had not died. He died while living. I may not have killed him in body, but I killed his spirit. Now he would never be the same again. It was a fate crueler than death for someone like him. I dragged his body down the mountain, and he made no effort to stop me. I head towards the broken valley where the battle was still taking place. It took me a few minutes. But I reached the battlefield. But unlike what I expected, the battlefield was still in silent. They had heard the cries of Mighty Eagle as I ripped off his wings. And it was such a chilling sound that they have stopped fighting. And were waiting for a definitive result. I tossed Mighty Eagle's body to the middle of his army. Then I made my way to my own soldiers. And noticed that there were barely a few hundred of them left. They bowed down to me to show respect as I stood in front of them. You did well. I praised them with a smile before I turned around to face the enemy army again. Their numbers had been significantly reduced, but their numbers still crossed a hundred thousand. Those who wish to continue being my enemy shall stat. But if you no longer have the will and courage, this is your final chance. My voice was deep and clear. It silenced every other sound. Run. And they did. If we were to continue fighting, they would overwhelm us eventually and would be able to take over the city. But such logic did not work on soldiers whose morale had hit rock bottom. They didn't trust logic in the face of an enemy who could achieve the impossible and create miracles. Also, their main aim had always been to kill me instead of taking over Gongman City, as they made it out to be. But with all of their main powerhouses gone, it was an impossible task to fight me. So all of them, a hundred thousand soldiers, an army that should be enough to fall any kingdom, slowly ran away with their tails between their leg. Maybe they would rest and build up their courage for a few days before marching towards us again. But for now, they were utterly defeated. Yeah, we won. General Tai Lung had LEDUS to victory. My soldiers cheered in victory at the sight of the retreating enemy. Third POV it was done. The enemy had been repelled, and Gongmen City had been protected. They came in hundreds of thousands. It was a superpower force never before seen in China. It was the force of three allied kingdoms. Their march caused earthquakes, and their sheer numbers eclipsed the sun. They tried yet they failed. The walking kingdom stood strong. Tai Lung along with his 2,000 soldiers, put a stop to this army and claimed victory. It was an event that would forever go down in the annals of history as one of the most remarkable defensive walls. And it took only one day for Tai Lung to squash the effort of 200,000 warriors. Lord Shen revealed a smile as he read the good news from the scroll which a messenger had delivered not too long ago. He was currently flying in the sky, on board his airship, which was on its way to the giant cities of Nanza. Behind him was a fleet of similar airships. The airships were dirty gold in color and made of copper. They had two huge balloons which were carefully suspended with copper, and it was attached to a small compartment that held bombs and soldiers. One other thing to notice was the black smoke which was constantly produced from the bottom of the airship. 
which made it almost appear like dark clouds from below. With all the forces he had, it was rather easy for him to repel the small invasion from Nanzao, since it was only a distraction. After defending the land, he had also sent some airships to help out Tylon. But before they even reached him, Shen got this wonderful news. Now, he and his fleet of airships were on their way to the cities of Nanzao. They were flying high in the sky and coupled with all the smoke they released to hide themselves. No one had seen them coming. They were sneaking up on the enemy just like the Allied Kingdom had done when they marched towards Gongnan City. And Shen was also going to be taking over their major cities, and trying to capture their capital. Just like they had tired to kill Tai Lung and take over Gongmen City. An eye for an eye. The only difference would be that he would be successful in his conquest. Truth to be told, Shen was pleased when he heard that the enemy had broken the codes of war. Because that meant that he would no longer have to mind Tai Lung and his morale and he would be able to break the codes as well. In a scenario where the codes of war were discarded, Shen and Tai Lung had all the advantage. Tai Lung with his individual strength and he, with his poise and cunning. So the fact that the enemy had broken the codes first, and they now had a reason to justify breaking the same codes, was good for them. He will make the best out of it. Lord Shen, we have reached their barracks which is just outside the city. Boss Wolf reported to Shen. He took out his binoculars and looked below. Shen noticed the city but his focus was on the barracks which were situated in the neighborhood of the city. That was where the army which was meant to guard the city was staying. A villainous smile stretched his beak as they flew right above the barracks. Drop the bombs. He ordered to his soldiers. Boss Wolf shared his smile before he went away. He took a flare and peeked his hand out from the side of their airship. Then he used the flare to signal the other ships. And with that, they started dropping bombs made from gunpowder. The enemy did not have time to react as they met their end. Destruction rained from the sky. The giant explosions and deaths were followed by the mad laughter of the white peacock. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much. And it keeps me going. Plus, it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.